Ah. Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters, and a very warm welcome to the guests that are joining us today. The topic for today's debate between our two esteemed guests, Ibrahim Ahmed and Samuel Green, is Is Muhammad foretold in the Bible? The topic is of significant importance as the Quran states in Surah Al Araf, chapter 7. They are the ones who follow the Messenger and the unlettered prophet, whose description they find in their Torah and the Gospel. He commands them to do good and forbids them from evil, permits for them what is lawful and forbids to them what is impure and relieves them from their burdens and the shackles that bound them. Only those who believe in him, honor and support him and follow the light sent down to him will be successful. Before I introduce our guests of honor, I wanna make sure to lay down some ground rules. Dawa Wise is a place of cordiality and respect. That being said, please be sure to keep negative comments to an absolute zero and hold the utmost respect for our speakers. The point of having these discussions is to come to objective truth and both speakers will be passionate about their position. This is no, uh, there is no need for heckling, trash talking, or any form of disrespect. The Quran tells us in many parts to speak kindly, chapter two, verse 83, truthfully, chapter three, verse 17, justly, chapter six, verse 152, graciously, chapter 17, verse 23, fairly, chapter 17, verse 28, politely, chapter 17, verse 53. And I'm sure every guest of every faith can appreciate and adhere to these wise reminders. At this point, I'd like to discuss the segments. We will have two 25-minute openings, beginning with Ibrahim. The speakers will be given a one-minute flexibility period in the event they run over time and this minute will be pulled from their initial rebuttal. Following the openings, we will have two rounds of rebuttals, which will be 12.5 minutes in duration. Following the rebuttals will be a question and answer session with Super Chats given priority. Each guest will have one minute to answer the question without comment or interruption from the other speaker. Finally, we will have concluding remarks beginning with Samuel. On behalf of Dowawise, I wanna thank you all for tuning in and I request for you to like, share, and engage with the comments section of the stream. Without further ado, please let me introduce the first guest, Ibrahim bin Ahmed. Ibrahim is a graduate student in Behind the Channel Proving Islam. His channel initially focused on polemics against Judaism and the Talmud, but his interests have since expanded to topics including intertextuality in the Quran and the topic of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the Bible. Ibrahim is a Salafi and has memorized the Quran. He has independently researched the biblical texts and also studied the Bible with scholars like Matthew Thiessen and Dale Allison. Our second guest is Samuel Green, who became a Christian at university and has been involved in various Christian ministries. Since 1999, he has worked with the Australian Fellowship of Evangelical Students as a campus evangelist and Islamic engagement director. Engaging with Islam is one of, Islam, uh, is one of Samuel's main interests, and he does this through writing, training, evangelism, lectures, and debates. He has a degree in theology and chemical engineering. Thank you both for taking the time out of your days to join us. At this point, I want to give you both a warm welcome. And uh, Ibrahim, the floor will be yours when you're ready to begin. I'm happy to share any content that you have and your timer will start uh, once you begin speaking. Um, yeah, all right, let me just, yeah, you can share. So just audio is everything fine, so I'll just um, begin. Now, assalamu alaikum. The first prophecy of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that I will bring up is Daniel chapter 2. In the chapter, the king of Babylon sees a vision of a rock smashing an idol. Daniel interprets the vision as meaning there will be five successive kingdoms. The first of, one, the first of which is the Babylonian Empire, and the final one of which is God's kingdom. Verses 39 to 40. After you, the Babylonian kingdom, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. Verse 44. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. So here we have, starting from Babylon, five successive kingdoms coming in order and ruling. If we look in history, the kingdoms to successively arrive after Babylon in order were Persia, Greece, Rome, and finally the Islamic Empire. All of these correspond to the kingdoms mentioned in verses 39 to 44. 
Persia was the kingdom to arise after Babylon, Greece was the third kingdom, Rome was the fourth kingdom, strong as iron, and finally, the Islamic Empire was the kingdom set up by the God of Heaven himself. Daniel makes it clear that these are successive kingdoms, and Jews and Christians agree by consensus that the kingdoms after Babylon were Persia, Greece, and Rome. Um, this is what the Benson commentary mentions. And in the days of these kings, that is kingdoms, or during the succession of these four monarchies, and it must be during the time of the last of them, because they are reckoned four in succession, and consequentially, this must be the fifth kingdom. Uh, talking about the kingdom of God. Rashi says, in the days of these kings, when the kingdom of Rome is still in existence. So the kingdom of God must be the one which arises after Rome. Ask yourself, which kingdom came after Rome historically? That was the Islamic Empire. When it came, it destroyed the Persians, conquered the Egyptians, took lands from Spain to China, uh, even took lands from the Romans, and eventually even destroyed the Roman Empire. Now, can the Islamic Empire be described as God's kingdom? Of course. While all four, Babylon, Greece, and Rome, were pagan empires, the Islamic Empire is a monotheistic empire, which was set up by God's own prophet, peace be upon him, and his companions. It also ruled by God's law, the Qur'an. At its beginning was the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and even Jesus, peace be upon him, will be a king of this empire when he returns as a follower of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and as a part of his nation slash ummah. After Jesus, peace be upon him, the day of judgment will come. The second prophecy I'd like to touch on is Isaiah chapter 9. Verse 6 reads, For a child is born for us, a son is given for us, and authority is upon his shoulder. You may also see this final phrase translated as, and the government is upon his shoulder. What does this phrase mean? Well, countless commentaries mention that the meaning of authority upon a shoulder is that he will have some sort of a symbol of authority upon his shoulder. Scholars like Adam Clark, as you can see uh, here, as well as Gill's exposition, I've put a commentary there as well. So scholars like Adam Clark mentioned in their commentaries that in ancient times, kings, commanders, generals, etc., they placed some sort of uh, symbol such as a key, a scepter, a sword, etc., upon their shoulder to symbolize their authority. In Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, a key is placed on Eliakim's shoulder to symbolize his, his authority. It reads, I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. So it's clear that the child born in Isaiah 9 will be born with or eventually have some sort of symbol of authority upon his shoulder as well. I will now quote some commentaries to support my position. So this is the Yale Anchor Bible Commentary, which is a highly respected academic commentary. They translate the phrase in Isaiah 9.6 as, The emblems of sovereignty rest on his shoulders, and they comment the following. Emblems of sovereignty, an attempt to render Mishra, which occurs only here, may point to investiture with a robe or other symbol of authority. See, for example, the key of the house of David placed on the shoulder of Eliakim in Isaiah 22.22. This is the New American Bible Revised Edition. They translate it as, uh, upon his shoulder, dominion rests. And they uh, comment, the reference may be to a particular act in the ritual in which a symbol of the king's authority is placed on his shoulder. Uh, other commentaries that mention the interpretation that this is speaking of the child having a symbol of authority upon his shoulder include Gill's exposition of the entire Bible, Adam Clark's commentary, John Calvin's commentary, Pulpit's commentary, Matthew Poole's commentary, Barnes Notes on the Bible, the Benson commentary, and finally, the Beacon Bible commentary, which paraphrases the phrase as, on his shoulder, he wears the badge of true authority. I can quote even more commentaries as well as more academic commentaries, uh, but I'll leave it here as these are sufficient. Now, the Islamic sources confirm that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had a symbol of authority known as the seal of prophethood on his left shoulder. This is from Sahih Muslim. Abdullah bin Sarjis radiallahu an reported, I then went after him and saw the seal of prophethood between his shoulders at his left shoulder, having spots on it like moles. He also mentioned, I thus saw the place of the seal on his shoulders. And this is also in Sahih Muslim. Jabir bin Samura mentions, And I saw the seal at his shoulder. Um, now, the point of the seal on the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, shoulder was that it was to be a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. We know this because, as is mentioned in, for example, Ibn Ishaq, Salman al-Farithi, who was a Christian, knew that the Prophet Gama would have a symbol of authority upon his shoulder, and when he saw it upon the Prophet's shoulder, he converted to Islam. Now, what will the child in Isaiah 9 do? Well, verse 4 makes it clear that his coming will result in the defeat of the enemies of Israel. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Now, this sort of language is used in the Torah for the Egyptian oppressors of Israel, like Pharaoh, right? As well as being used for the Assyrian foreign oppressors in other chapters of Isaiah. Jeremiah uses this language for the Babylonian oppressors of Israel, and even Isaiah 14 uses it for the Babylonian oppressors of Israel. Now, did the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, coming lead to the defeat of foreign oppressors of Israel? The answer is yes. Beginning with the Jewish-Roman wars, 
the Romans had oppressed the Israelites, and even before, actually. They then destroyed the temple, exiled the Jews, and placed a pagan temple on Mount Zion. When Rome became Christian, it persecuted the Israelites further. Even at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Roman Christians had banned the Jews from entering Jerusalem and had filled the holy sites, holy sites on Mount Zion with trash, filth, and even menstrual blood. This all changed with the coming of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. His companions went out as an army under the leadership of Umar, radiallahu an, the second caliph of Islam and the companion of the Prophet Muhammad. And this army conquered Jerusalem. The Muslims even conquered Palestine as a whole, and they took it from the Roman Christians who had been oppressing the Israelites for 500 years. The holy, south, the holy sites on the Temple Mount were cleansed, and the Jews were allowed back in Jerusalem. Note that the child in the chapter cannot be Jesus. Jesus was rejected by the Jews, and as punishment, God sent the Roman foreigners, God sent the Roman foreigners to destroy the temple, kill the Jews, and exile them. That is the opposite of what the child in Isaiah 9 will do, which is deliver them from foreign oppression. Verse 7 mentions that the child will bring everlasting peace to David's throne and kingdom. Indeed, the Muslims brought Islam to Palestine, aka David's kingdom. As Psalm 119, 165 says, Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. And the Muslims testify to the inner peace, the Quran, and the teachings of Islam provide us with. Uh, verse 2 describes the people in darkness as having seen a great light, which is the light of the Quran slash Islam. And verse 1 also mentions the child bringing honor to Galilee, which the Muslims did when they freed it from the Romans and brought Islam to Galilee. All right. Now I will move on to my third prophecy, Isaiah chapter 19, verses 20 to 25. Now this is an interesting chapter, so it relates a few prophecies about Egypt. The first set of prophecies are in verses 1 to 15, and they refer to judgment that will come on Egypt. Uh, this was fulfilled by the Assyrian invasion of Egypt, as both the Yale Anchor Bible and the Jewish Study Bible mention. The Yale Anchor Bible commentary further mentions that verses 16 to 17 refer to certain events when the Persians invaded Egypt in 525 BC, and they give some other possible interpretations as well. The next prophecy is in verses 18 to 20 and uh, discusses basically how five cities in Egypt will begin to worship God and how there will be a temple in Egypt. And uh, commenters all throughout the Jewish Study Bible, Yale Anchor Bible Commentary, the Talmud in Manakot 109b16, Ibn Ezra, Joseph, and countless Christian commentaries like Pulpit and Benson, they confirm that this is just speaking about how Nias IV had a temple erected in Egypt and some of the Jews who were settled in Egypt would worship God there. But from halfway, uh, halfway through verse 20 till the end of the chapter, we encounter a final prophecy which relates that the Egyptians in general will turn to the worship of the one God. Verse 21 states, And the Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians, and in that day they will acknowledge the Lord. They will worship with sacrifices and gifts. They will make vows to the Lord and keep them. The Egyptians today are Muslims, hence the coming of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him fulfill the scripture. Note how it mentions that the Egyptians will bring sacrifices. This could not refer to Christianity, for the book of Hebrews says that Jesus was the final sacrifice. Also keep in mind that uh, Christianity is the worship of three gods, not one, which is contrary to Isaiah's theology. Verses 23 to 25 then mention that even the Assyrians in general will, co will convert to the worship of the one God. Quote, the Egyptians and Assyrians will worship together. And that day, Israel will be third, along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth. The Lord Almighty will bless them, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. Not only are the Egyptians today Muslims, but even the Assyrians, Iraq, Turkey, Syria, etc., they're all Muslim lands with Muslim populations. Even the Israelites became Muslims. When you look at the lands where they were exiled by the Assyrians, Babylonians, and Romans, these are Muslim lands with Muslim populations. So this is Isaiah 11, verse 11. It, it lists the locations where the Israelites would be exiled. At that time, the Lord will again reach out and take his people who are left from Assyria, North Egypt, South Egypt, Ethiopia, Elam, Babylonia, Hamath, and from the coastlands of the sea. Note how these are Muslim lands with Muslim populations. While many of the exiled Israelites may have lost their identities, they did indeed become Muslims. Think about the quote-unquote ten lost tribes that were exiled in the Assyrian period. They aren't actually lost, they just assimilated. Right? So they may, many of them may have lost their identities, but of course the lands where they assimilated became Muslim lands. So verse 24 describes the three nations as being a blessing in the midst of the earth because Israel was understood to be in the middle of uh, the earth with Assyria above and Egypt below. And the Jewish study Bible confirms that Isaiah 19 is talking about Assyria and Egypt converting as part of God's universal kingdom. And the Gentiles in general will convert to the uh, worship of the one God, as is mentioned in other texts in Isaiah. Assyria and Egypt have been uh, highlighted here because these were the arch enemies of the Israelites. All right. Um, 
It's the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is coming that converted the Egyptians, Assyrians, and Israelites to the worship of the one God, just like Isaiah 19 foretells. Just a note at the end, if you're reading through Isaiah 19, you'll often encounter this phrase, on that day. Note that the phrase, on that day, especially in prophecy, sometimes means after that time. Matthew Henry mentions this. The Benson Commentary mentions this on Isaiah 19, verse 18. There's also the clear contextual meaning in Isaiah 19, because Isaiah 19 uh, starts by talking about how Egypt will be punished and says five cities, five cities will worship God, then says the Egyptians in general will worship God. Obviously, these are not happening at the same time, but successively. So you have to see when it means on that day and when it means after that time. Isaiah 18 also uses the phrase, phrase on that day to mean after that time. All right. Now, I'll move on to my next set of texts. These are towards the end of 1st Isaiah. Uh, so here, towards the end of 1st Isaiah, we encounter certain prophecies about a time when the spiritually blind will see, the spiritually deaf will hear, etc. These are Isaiah 29, 32, and 35 that, that I will discuss. And these texts were fulfilled by the Muslims. The first of these texts I will discuss is Isaiah chapter 29, verses 17 to 24. This is not verse 12, Isaiah 29, 12, which is famous. I'm looking at a different passage. So this text begins by speaking about how Lebanon will turn into caramel or a fertile field. This is simply language of spiritual reform. Lebanon was often seen as barren and uncultivated, and hence the spiritually barren are being represented by Lebanon. These spiritually dead people will turn into a fertile field, meaning they will become spiritually awoken. This understanding is confirmed by commentaries like Barnes Notes on the Bible, the James uh, Fawcett Brown Bible Commentary, and Pulpit's Commentary. Now, the key verse in this chapter is verse 18. I quote, In that day, the deaf will hear the words of a book, and out of gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. This was fulfilled in the Quran. Surah 14, Ayah 1 reads, Alif Lam Ra, a book that we have sent down to you, that you might bring mankind out of darknesses into the light by the permission of their Lord, to the path of the exalted in might, the praiseworthy. Indeed, the Quran brought the world out from paganism into monotheism. And just a note, Isaiah 29, 18 literally says a book. It lacks a, definite, lacks a definite article, as has been noticed by commentaries like Pulpit. So then uh, another feature of these texts, which describe this time that the blind will see, the deaf will hear, etc., is that we see at this time a king will rule. Isaiah 32, 1. See, a king will reign in righteousness and rulers will rule with justice. When the Muslims brought Islam to Palestine and Jerusalem, Umar radiallahu an was the king of the Muslim empire and he ruled in righteousness. And there were other Muslim kings after him as well. Another feature of these texts that describe a time when the blind will see, etc., is that at this time a desert will rejoice. For example, Isaiah chapter 35, verse 1. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. The coming of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, made the Arabian desert rejoice and awakened its inhabitants spiritually. Islam also spread to other deserts and made them rejoice as well. Isaiah 35 also mentions that at this point, a Jewish exile will end and the Israelites will be allowed to return back to Jerusalem. Verse 10, and the ransomed of the Lord will return and enter Zion with joyful shouting. And this talking about the exile ending as everyone, uh, everyone recognizes. Now, Umar radiallahu an, he ended the Jewish exile and allowed the Israelites to come back into Jerusalem. This is what uh, Daniel al-Qamusi mentions, who was a rabbi from the 10th century. For before he came, the king of Ishmael, who defeated the king of the south, that is the Byzantine emperor, they could not come to Jerusalem, and they would come from the four quarters of the earth to Tiberias and Gaza to see the temple. But now with his coming, he brought them to Jerusalem and gave them a place, and many of Israel settled there. And afterwards, Israel came from the four corners of the earth to Jerusalem to preach and pray. Uh, basically, when the Christians were in charge of Jerusalem and even the Romans like the Romans before Christianity as well. Basically, when the Romans were in charge, the Jews were not allowed in Jerusalem. They could only come once a year to look at the destruction of the temple and cry and then go back. They could only come to Tiberias and Gaza and see the temple destroyed, etc. But when Umar radiallahu an came, he allowed the Israelites to return uh, to Jerusalem. So basically, in these texts towards the end of Isaiah, when the blind will see, the deaf will hear, etc. Spiritually blind will see, spiritually deaf will hear, etc. Um... So in other words, there will be a spiritual reform, especially from paganism to monotheism, which the Muslims did. Um, in this time, in these texts that, that speak about this time, uh, we have this idea that a scripture from God will be heard by the people, a righteous king will rule, 
the desert will rejoice and the Israelites will be allowed to return to Jerusalem. Now the Muslims brought the pagans out from darkness into monotheism. They recited the Quran to the people. They made the desert of Arabia as well as other deserts rejoice. Umar radiallahu an ruled as a righteous king and allowed the Israelites back into Jerusalem and uh, other Muslim kings ruled as well. I'll now move on to my next prophecy, Isaiah chapter 42. I will now quote some sections from it. Verses 1 to 2. Here is my slave whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. Verses 6 to 8. I, the Lord, will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people, a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sin in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to foreign images, nor my praise to graven images. Now, throughout Isaiah 42, it describes how the servant will convert the Gentiles to monotheism, including the Kedarites in verse 11. Let the desert and its cities lift up their voices. The settlements where Kedar inhabits. Let the inhabitants of Salah sing aloud. Let them shout from joy from the tops of the mountains. Now, the Kedarites are Arab Ishmaelites, as Genesis 25 and Ezekiel chapter 27, verse 21 confirm. Salah, interestingly, is a mountain in Medina, and it existed at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him as well. Verse 17 goes on to say, But those who trust in idols, who say to images, You are our gods, they will be turned back in utter shame. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, how did he fulfill Isaiah 42? Well, he was God's slave, who brought the law of God to the nations. Even the rabbis of Medina described him as not raising his voice in the marketplace, as verse 2 says, and he was a covenant to the Israelites, as Surah 2, Ayah 100 confirms. He was a light to the Gentiles, and it is he who brought the Gentiles to monotheism, opening their eyes from the darkness of paganism into monotheism. He even converted the Arabs, as is mentioned in verse 11, and made them rejoice. He also, keep, uh, he also came to the people of Medina, where Mount Salah is, and he made them rejoice. Further, he destroyed the idols of the Arabs, and his followers destroyed idols in the lands that they conquered, and turning back the idolaters in utter shame. Uh, all right, I'll move on to another prophecy now. This is Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, where God tells Abraham, all people on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham's descendants will bless the nations. Now, uh, this text was fulfilled by the Ishmaelite prophet and his Ishmaelite followers who blessed the nations by converting them to monotheism. Before the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Israelites were not able to bless the nations. Um, now, my interlocutor might use Genesis 26, which says Isaac's children will bless the nations. But Genesis 26 never says... It will only happen through Isaac's children. Genesis 12 makes it clear that it's open to any of the descendants of Abraham. The prophecy can be fulfilled through multiple nations from Abraham. Uh, because Genesis also promises that Abraham's descendants will be exceedingly multiplied. And this was fulfilled through both the Ishmaelites and Israelites, as is clear from Genesis 16 and 17. And Genesis 12 says that God will make Abraham into a great nation. And if you read Genesis 17 and 46, again, you see that promise will be fulfilled through both the Ishmaelites and the Israelites. So the, uh, as for the promise that uh, Isaac's children will bless the nations, the coming of the Prophet Muhammad fulfilled this as well, because the righteous remnant of Isaac's seed, such as Abdullah bin Salam radiallahu an, and Kaab al-Ahbar, who converted uh, to Islam, these were a uh, righteous remnant of Israelites, they converted to Islam, and they helped spread it, and they hence fulfilled the prophecy of Isaac's seed blessing the nations. Also in the Quran, we have um, testimony from Israelites who became Muslims. And that's used as an inspiration in the Quran for others to convert. And if you look in Deuteronomy, the idea of, uh, the idea of light to the nations, uh, you're so righteous that the other nations want to convert because you're righteous. The Israelites are righteous. So similarly, the Quran has the testimony of these Israelites who converted, and that inspires the Gentiles to convert and increases their faith as well. Now, Jesus, who is a descendant of Isaac, will also again fulfill the prophecy when he returns and rules over the Messianic kingdom, meaning the prophecy of Isaac's children, blessing the nations. Interestingly, uh, Genesis 12.3 can also be translated as all nations will use Abraham's name when they bless. Muslims pray five times a day for the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his people to be blessed. And we mention the name of Abraham when we do this. We say, oh Allah, bless Muhammad and the people of Muhammad, just as you blessed Abraham and his people. All right, uh, I'll now move on to my second last prophecy, which is Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. And suddenly the master you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. Note the parallelism makes it clear that the master and messenger of the covenant are the same individual. 
Suddenly, the master you are seeking will come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. See, he is coming. Note the parallelism. From the verse, it is clear that the messenger of the covenant will suddenly come to the temple. This was fulfilled on the night of Yisra, when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was suddenly taken from Mecca to the temple in Jerusalem, and he led the prophets in prayer there. Who souls with him? Surah 17, Ayah 1. Glorified is the one who took his slave at night from Masjid al-Haram, the mosque in Mecca, to Masjid al-Aqsa, the temple, so that we may show him our signs. Indeed, he is the hearing, the seeing. Note that the temple can refer not only to the building, but also to the land upon which the temple was built. So this is proven by uh, texts such as Ezra chapter 2, verse 68, um, which uh, refers to the Israelites coming to the house of the Lord before when there wasn't an actual physical building there. It's also proven by uh, Jeremiah 41.5. Basically, the ruins of the temple or the land upon which the temple is built can be referred to as temple. Now, Isaiah chapter 40 makes it clear that this individual in Malachi chapter 3 will come just before the end of an exile. Uh, uh, Christians agree that Isaiah 40 and Malachi chapter 3 speak of the same individual. Isaiah 40 speaks about someone in the uh, desert uh, proclaiming, prepare the way for God, etc., and at the beginning of Isaiah 40, it says that the punishment on Jerusalem is about to end, which by consensus is known to be an exile. So it's clear that Malachi chapter 3 will be fulfilled just before the end of an exile. And uh, the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, came to the temple suddenly just before the Roman exile ended, which again, I've discussed the Muslims ended the Roman exile. All right. Uh, the final prophecy I will quote is Matthew chapter 21. So here, Jesus gives a parable about how God keeps sending prophet after prophet to Israel, but Israel keeps killing them. And he concludes in verse 43 by telling Israel that, quote, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to another nation that shall bear its fruits. Now, the kingdom of God, in context, it uh, refers to prophecy, as is clear from the context of the parable, which is Israel killing the prophets who come to them with prophecy. The word nation is in the singular, so the Israelites are being replaced by a single nation. Christians claim this is about Gentiles replacing the Israelites, but the word nation is in the singular, so it does not refer to the Gentiles in general, but one specific Gentile nation. The Arabs replaced the, the Arabs replaced the Jews because the awaited prophet came from the Arabs, was given an Arabic Quran, which abrogated the Torah, and the direction of prayer switched from Jerusalem to Mecca. In Deuteronomy, the hope was that Israel would be righteous and convert the Gentiles thereby, but they failed. Jesus said the nation which would replace the Jews would, quote, bear its fruits. And indeed, when the Ishmaelites were tasked with the job of converting the Gentiles to monotheism, they succeeded. So in summary, I've shown how the kingdom of heaven was the empire to come after Rome in Daniel chapter 2, and how the Islamic empire was the one to fulfill this historically. I've also, uh, I've also shown how the prophet Muhammad had a symbol of authority on his shoulder, as Isaiah 9 mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and his coming led to Palestine being freed from Roman oppression. I've shown how the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him's coming is what converted the Egyptians, Assyrians, and Israelites to monotheism as Isaiah 19 foretold. I've also shown how Isaiah 29 prophesizes the Quran as a book that will open the eyes of the blind. I then mentioned how Isaiah 32 uh, foretells that at this time, Umar radiallahu an will rule as a righteous king, and how Isaiah 35 foretold that at this time, the Muslims would make the desert rejoice and end the Roman exile. I also touched on Isaiah 42, and with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is described as a light to the Gentiles who will convert the nations and the Arabs. I then showed how the Ishmaelites blessed the nations, fulfilling the promise to Abraham in Genesis 12. And I showed how the Prophet Muhammad suddenly came to the temple just before the end of the Roman exile, fulfilling Malachi chapter 3. I finally showed how the Ishmaelites replaced the Israelites, fulfilling Jesus' prophecy in Matthew chapter 21, verse 43. And that's it for my presentation. Hmm. Well done. All right. In time, we've got 30 seconds extra. We can utilize that for uh, Samuel Green to get set up. Uh, Samuel, I'm going to go ahead and show you. And time will begin whenever you start speaking, sir. Well, it's great to be with everyone today, and thank you for that careful presentation, Ibrahim. I'll now give my presentation. Um, and as has already been said, the Quran does say that Muhammad is foretold in the Bible, 
We read here, those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet whom they find written in the Torah, the gospel, uh, which is with them. And so it's talking about the scriptures that are with the Christians and that Muhammad is in the, the scriptures. I'm going to be looking at this today and looking at three points. I'm going to look at Muhammad does not fit into the message of the Bible. There are no verses predicting Muhammad in the Bible. And finally, the Bible warns us against Muhammad. So the first one is Muhammad doesn't fit into the Bible. What is the Bible? The Bible is not one book. It's a collection of many books from many prophets over about a 1500 year period. And it, it has a story to it. It begins with God creating the world and it goes through the history of the world and it goes up to the final coming of the kingdom of God being revealed in on earth. And so there's this story there. And so you need to know the story. And my point here is just that Muhammad doesn't fit into this story. The story of the Bible, as I've said, is that God has created us. Uh, we're meant to glorify and serve God. But sin has corrupted us and we're corrupted. And we see throughout all the prophets that we are unable to worship God. We're unable to worship God. We keep falling back into sin. And so God makes these covenants through Noah, through uh, to, for, with his commitment to creation, through Abraham to bless the nations, through Israel, to Israel to be a priestly kingdom. And from David, there's the covenant of the coming Messiah. And when we read the prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel and others, the kingdom that the Messiah brings the final Messiah will be the resurrection kingdom of God. And so just the story of the Bible is that it's waiting for the coming Messiah. That's that's how it goes. They're waiting for the coming Messiah. Just as Jews today are waiting for the coming Messiah. That's the story. Now, that's not the story of the Quran. Right? The Quran has a, a different story. It certainly has the idea of creation. But then it has the idea that we've turned away and forgotten God's laws, but we're not corrupted by sin. We're able to worship God. We're, we're born pure. And that God has sent messengers to every nation on earth, and it, which is different to the, the Bible, saying again and again that Israel's that unique nation. It has Jesus coming, but then it has Muhammad as the last prophet. Now, that's a completely different story to what we have in the Bible. It's just a, a different story to what we find in the prophets. And so, in, in, the, you know, there are, in the same way that Baha'i Allah from the Baha'i religion doesn't fit into the Quran story, uh, so too Muhammad just doesn't fit into the biblical story. He's just got, the Quran's got a different story. He it, 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 it just doesn't fit into it. So that's my first point. The result of this is that Muslims have some Muslims have recognized this and so they've rewritten the Bible to give it a different story. And you find this with the gospel of according to Islam from 1979 and from the 14th century with the gospel of Barnabas, where they've just rewritten the story to make a different story to make Muhammad fit into it. But the reason these books have been written is that Muhammad doesn't fit into the Bible. And so you've got to rewrite it to make him fit in. I now want to move on to my second point, and that is to look at a series of verses to see uh, which are commonly used uh, where, where Muslims will claim these refer to Jesus. So the first one is in Genesis chapter 16 to 17, where it refers to Ishmael, amongst other things. But as I want to point out, it's very clear that Ishmael is not how the covenant comes. As for Ishmael, this is God speaking to Abraham, I have heard you, I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant, remember, this is the covenant that's been given to Abraham. So the covenant with Abraham, I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you this time next year. And so the promise of the covenant, it doesn't go to, 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 uh, to Ishmael. It's quite explicit. And we'll see this in later generations. It, it doesn't go to Esau, it goes to Jacob. And so it's very explicit that it's not going to Esau. 
Deuteronomy 18 is a, a very pop, uh, common verse that people will bring up, that Muslims will bring up. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command you. And so the Muslim claim is that this is Muhammad. Well, first of all, we need to put the verses in their chapter, in their context. And we see here that Deuteronomy 18 is part of a wider section about leadership within Israel. It talks about the judges. It talks about the kings. It talks about the priests. It talks about the prophets. And you can see they're referred to as among your brothers in those verses there. And so it's talking about a prophet from within Israel. It's not talking about somebody from another nation, from another country. The second point is that if you want to be a prophet like Moses, you've got to agree with Moses, at least on the basic level. And as I've shown here in this table, Moses teaches we're made in the image of God. That's not taught in the Quran. Moses teaches the fatherhood and son of God. That's not in the Quran. Moses teaches that God comes to dwell with his people. That's not in the Quran. We're on a journey to God. Moses teaches that we're corrupted by sin. That's not in the Quran. Uh, there's the priesthood and the sacrifice for atonement for sin. That's not in the Quran. There's the covenants, which I've already pointed out. And, and so you've got to agree with Moses, and Muhammad just doesn't agree with Moses. Uh, we see this at certain points. Um, do not set up any, so this is from the Torah, do not set up any Asherah pole beside the altar. You build to the Lord your God. Do not erect a sacred stone. And so Moses is very clear that uh, sacred stones are considered part of idolatry. And this is what we have within Islam. Uh, I know Islam likes to say that it liberated people from idolatry, but that's not what the early Christians thought of it. And if you look at this where you're kissing a stone and seeking Allah's blessing from it, then that, that appears to be idolatry. So I'm not convinced that it, it is saving people from idolatry. My third point for why Muhammad is not a prophet like Moses is that a prophet like Moses must speak in the name of Yahweh. It's very explicit in verse 20 that you've got to speak in the name of Yahweh. And Muhammad didn't do that. He spoke in the name of Allah. Uh, Ilah is the name, is the word for God in Arabic. Uh, Allah is the name of God. And so the Quran just speaks in it. Muhammad just spoke in the name of a different God. Uh, my fourth point for why Muhammad is not a prophet like Moses is that Deuteronomy 34 verse 10 says that uh, the, the prophet, to be a prophet like Moses, you do miracles. There are signs for what you do. And it talks about how no one's been like Muhammad, like uh, Moses doing these signs. And, and what's interesting is the Quran even says this as well. It says, why are not signs sent to him like those which were sent to Moses? And so it's very specific that to those who were observing Muhammad, he wasn't like Moses in that he didn't give these signs. And finally, uh, it's the, the gospel, because remember, the question tonight is, is uh, Muhammad foretold in the Bible? So we've got to let all the Bible uh, explain itself. And the Bible says explicitly that Jesus is the prophet like Moses. We see this in John 14 and in Acts uh, chapter 3 and 7, in that Jesus does the types of things that Moses did, uh, you know, the feeding of the people in the wilderness, um, going up on mountains and encountering God, those types of things. Um, another popular one is Surah 33, verse 2, where it is said that this is a prophecy speaking about th uh, three different prophets to come, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. He said, the Lord came from Sinai and dawned over them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the myriads of the holy ones from the south, from the mountain slopes. And it said that it, it said that these locations represent prophets. Now, first of all, these are just the locations for the, the Israelites as they come out of Egypt on their journey to Canaan. So they didn't go down via Mecca. They just went up via, you know, from Egypt to Canaan. And it's talking about locations. It's just not mentioning prophets anywhere. So you've got to make the grounds for why this would represent prophets when 
It's not mentioning prophets or revelation or anything. Psalm 84 is often used uh, as they pass through the valley of Baca and it, on their way to Zion. Uh, and it said, well, Jerusalem is, uh, sorry, Mecca is spoken of as Becca in the Quran. But again, the, the, the psalm is just talking about Israelites on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And Becca is actually um, just in Lebanon. It's very close to Israel and they would travel through this. This is the Becca Valley. You can look it up. So it's not talking about Mecca. Uh, it, it's just talking about the Becca Valley, which is quite close to the Israelites in Jerusalem. The Song of Songs is a, a famous one. Um, and so just a few brief notes on this. His mouth is sweetness itself. He is altogether lovely. This is my lover and my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. And so it's claimed here that the word for altogether lovely, uh, which is Mahmadim, is referring to Muhammad because it sort of sounds like Muhammad. Now, the first thing to say is that this is what's called the phonic fallacy. And that is just because a word sounds similar in one language to another language, it doesn't mean they mean the same thing. So, for instance, in Hebrew, in the Hebrew Bible, the word Allah, which you can see there, means oak tree. And so you can have similar words, similar sounding words. They don't necessarily mean the same thing. My second point here would be that uh, in Isaiah, sorry, in Song of Songs, the word's not being used as a name. It's not being used as a name. It's, it's being used as a descriptive word. And this word, Mahmadim, is used on many occasions in the Old Testament, and it just means lovely, beautiful. And so it's not being used as a name. It's not a name. And there's no indication that it is being used as a name. So we've got to let the context determine what the word means. Isaiah 29, we, uh, Ibrahim brought this up in uh, his presentation. Uh, or if you give the scroll to someone who cannot read and say, please read this, he will answer, I don't know how to read. And so the idea here is that um, the person who can't read is Muhammad because he's apparently he's illiterate. And so this is referring to the, the, the scroll of the Quran. However, if we just read the verse before, we see that the, it's actually talking about the book of Isaiah itself. And we see this from Isaiah chapter 6, where it talks about God hardening their hearts so that they won't see the message of Isaiah. And, and so you see this in verse 11. For you, this whole vision, that is the vision of Isaiah, is nothing but words sealed on a scroll. If you give them the scroll, to, if you give the scroll to someone who can read and say to him, please read this, he'll answer, I can't read, it's sealed. So that is someone who can read, but it's sealed up, he just doesn't understand it. Or if you give the scroll to someone who cannot read and say, please read this, he'll answer, I don't know how to read. So it's not talking about someone who can't read. It's talking about someone who can, someone who can't. The vision's referring to, sorry, the, the, the scroll it's referring to is the scroll of Isaiah. That's how it's introduced. And in fact, as we continue, um, we see that the scroll is going to be heard and understood by people. And so uh, just in a few verses later, in that day, the deaf will hear the words of the scroll, that is, of Isaiah. They're going to understand this, of the, um, the book of Isaiah. And it's Jesus who actually refers to this in Matthew uh, chapter 13 and parallel passages. He quotes Isaiah and, and he says, I'm the one who's uh, allowing people to see this. I'm, I'm the one who's, uh, who's um, bringing, you know, uh, opening the eyes of people and revealing the mystery of God. So if we allow the Bible to interpret itself, Matthew actually says uh, in the gospel, it actually says that Jesus is the one, or actually Jesus himself just directly refers to Isaiah and says, I'm the one opening the eyes of the blind so that people can understand the mystery of God. And of course, Jesus does this physically. He, he, he shows that he is the one who can open people's eyes to the word of God and to the truth of God by physically opening people's eyes. And so he does the miracles to back up that he is the one who's actually bringing the fulfillment of Isaiah. Isaiah 42, uh, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. Now, Ibrahim's raised this, but when we just read the book of Isaiah, it's very clear that the servant is 
Israel. It's either the nation of Israel being referred to or the faithful servant within Israel, the faithful one of Israel. But it's explicit. So, but you, O Israel, my servant. This is just in the previous chapter. And so um, if we let the book of Isaiah interpret itself, the servant is Israel. Now, what have I got here? And, and then uh, and then, if we keep reading in Isaiah 42, it does refer to Kedah, but if we have a look, it actually refers to all the nations of the world. It's referring to people far and wide and how they'll rejoice at the coming of God's servant and the salvation that he will bring. So sing to the Lord a new song. So, so th this is just a few more verses uh, in chapter 42. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the ends of the earth, you who go down to the sea, so you go down at the sea, and all you islands and all who live in them, let the desert and its towns raise their voices and the settlements of Kedah rejoice and the people of Silah uh, shout for joy the mountaintop. So you see, it's talking about the people in the sea, the islands, the people in the desert. It's just saying that when God's salvation comes, they'll all rejoice. It nowhere says that there'll be a prophet from there, but actually that this prophet will listen to the servant from Israel. Um, Daniel chapter 7, um, I might come back to this in my rebuttal because that helps me with Isaiah 2. Let's just go down to, um, I think, John 14. I'll finish up with this one. So in John 14, uh, it, it, another famous verse, it says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another counsellor to be with you forever. And the claim is that Muhammad is this counsellor, the, the, the paraclete. Now, again, we need to just read in context because in the following verses, Jesus makes it explicit who the paraclete is. He says, all this I have spoken while still with you, but the, but the counsellor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So Jesus identifies the counsellor as the Holy Spirit. And then later on in John, we actually are told that Jesus gives them the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so at the end of the, uh, uh, the gospel, and with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So just reading the book on its own terms, John the Baptist promised that Jesus would give the Spirit. Jesus says, I'm going to give you the Spirit, and then he, he gives the Spirit. Um, this is actually what the prophets before Jesus said would happen. So in the book of Numbers, this is in the law of Moses, it, you have Moses there saying, uh, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that the Lord's people were all prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. So that's from the Torah. Then the prophet Ezekiel, I will put my spirit into you. And then the prophet Joel, it shall come to pass that I will pour out my spirit. And then John the Baptist comes and says that Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So that's what the whole Bible says, that Jesus is coming to bring the Holy Spirit. I think particularly when it comes to Islam, uh, that, that it's unusual to say that Muhammad is the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is a person in the Quran. And so it's unusual to say that Muhammad's the Holy Spirit when the Quran says he's not the Holy Spirit. And so I've, I've got that table there where it just sort of shows how Muhammad is not the Holy Spirit. So in John chapter 14, the Spirit's called the Holy Spirit. In the Quran, the whole, there's the Holy Spirit, but that's not Muhammad. In John 14 and 16, the Spirit's called the Spirit of Truth. The Holy Spirit's called the Spirit of Truth. Muhammad's not called the Spirit of Truth. In John 14, the Holy Spirit brings revelation from God. In the Quran, the Holy Spirit brings revelation from God. Muhammad receives revelation. He doesn't bring it. So I won't go through all of them, but you can see there that from, from what I can see, a better Islamic explanation is that the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. And this lines up with what Jesus is saying in John 14. Uh, the Quran and actually John have a lot more in common regarding the Holy Spirit at that point. Now, I want to finish up by looking at how the Bible warns us against Muhammad. Uh, so it, I want to look at two warnings. It says, uh, if what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. 
And so if, if a prophet says something that doesn't happen, then you don't need to worry about that prophet. Now, in Sahih Muslim, we're actually told about Muhammad talking about the time of the last hour, the, the coming of the last hour. And we read, Anas bin Malik reported that a person asked Allah, Allah's apostle, uh, when would the last hour come? Thereupon Allah's messenger, may peace be upon him, kept quiet for a while, then looked at a young boy in his presence belonging to the tribe of Az Shu Shua Aya, and said, if this boy lives, he would not grow very old till the last hour would come to you. And it said that this young boy was of our age during those days. Now, that just didn't happen. That just didn't happen. That's a false prophecy. And you can find many prophecies like this about the coming hour and the conquest of Constantinople. So what he said just didn't happen. Jesus said to us to watch out for false prophets, for they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. And so we do need to be warned about false prophets. Now, what is the number one thing we should be looking at from a Christian perspective is, well, what do they teach about Jesus? What is their gospel message? And uh, the Apostle Paul makes it clear that even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. Well, that's the Christian standpoint. That's the Bible's standpoint. And we're meant to be looking at what the, the Bible says. The Bible says if you teach a different gospel, you're not from God. Even if an angel comes and teaches a different gospel, you're not from God. And Muhammad taught a different gospel. He denied that Jesus is the son of God. I mean, that's one of the titles for the, the Messiah. It's the son of God's all the way through the prophets. Denies he's the son of God. Uh, most Muslims see that it, it, it denies that he died on the cross, though it depends on verses, and I'm not going to get into that now. But it's certainly a, a different gospel message. And so we don't accept Muhammad as a prophet. It would, Jesus warned us against prophets who are going to change the gospel message. So to conclude, I think that's my last point there. Uh, to conclude, um, today we've looked at, at three points. Um, we've seen that the, the Quran actually appeals to the Bible and says that Christians and Jews can know that Muhammad's a genuine prophet because he's foretold in the Bible. And so the Quran appeals to the Bible as a source of authority to prove Muhammad's prophethood. What I'm saying as a Christian is what I've said tonight is that when we, we look at the Bible, we actually see that it doesn't prove Muhammad's prophethood. First of all, Muhammad does not fit into the big story of the Bible. He just has a different story. Secondly, there are no verses predicting the coming of a prophet like Muhammad. And finally, uh, we've got Muhammad giving false prophecies and a different gospel message, which are signs of a prophet that you don't listen to. So I'll finish up there. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Samuel. So uh, that concludes the opening statements. Uh, we're going to head on over to the next segment, which is the rebuttals. The rebuttals are going to be 12 and a half minutes each since uh, both of our panelists were very respectful and cordial with their time. There's no need for any of the one minute flexibility. So with that being said, I would like to open up the floor to uh, Ibrahim to start the very first rebuttal. And your timer will start uh, when you begin speaking. All right, so uh, just give me a minute to start my timer um, now. Okay, right, so first thing, uh, I'll just go scattered here. So one thing Samuel mentioned is that uh, the Prophet Muhammad doesn't do miracles according to the Quran. This is Surah 37, Ayah 15, uh, or Ayah 14. وَإِذَا رَأُوا آيَةً يَسْتَسْخِرُونَ And when they see a miracle, they make fun of it. This is Surah 6, Ayah 124. وَإِذَا جَاءَتْهُمْ آيَةٌ قَالُوا لَنْ نُؤْمِنَ حَتَّى نُؤْتَى مِثْلَ مَا أُوْتِيَ رُسُلُ اللَّهِ And when a miracle comes to them, a sign comes to them, they say, we will never believe it until we are given that which was given to the messengers of Allah. Surah 54, Ayah 1, or actually I'll go to Ayah 2, that's what it says. وَإِنْ رَوْ آيَةً يُعْرِدُ وَيَقُولُوا سِحْرٌ مُسْتَمِرٌ And if they see a miracle, they turn away and say passing magic. There are other uh, verses in the Quran which say that miracles will come but you have to wait for them. Like in Surah 10, they ask for miracles and they're told, wait. 
So they are coming. Just wait. Even in Surah 6, one of the verses I just read, previously they had asked for miracles and they were only given later. Uh, in Ayah 124, it mentions them being given. Uh, other things he mentioned. So he says that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, doesn't fit into the message of the Bible. Uh, and he was bringing up that Jesus is the Messiah, etc. By the way, we believe Jesus is the Messiah. We have plenty of hadith about Jesus ruling in the end of times, etc. So we don't believe that all those texts are incorrect in the Bible or any, anything. It's just that we also believe that the Prophet Muhammad would come, not only the Messiah, Jesus, which is something which was found amongst Jews as well. Uh, the earliest Jews that we know of were expecting not only the Messiah, but a prophetic figure as well. This is mentioned in many places. Uh, Howard and M. Tebow wrote a whole book on it called The uh, Mosaic Eschatological Prophet. If you look in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they're not only expecting Messiah, they're also uh, expecting a prophet. In the New Testament, in the Gospel of John, they're not only expecting Messiah, but they're also expecting a prophet. And uh, there are many other evidences as well of like this idea that Mosaic times will, will return. And throughout the Bible, it's clear as well. Um, he, he brought a chart to sh uh, show like uh, differences between Islam and the Old Testament. First of all, many of the things mentioned there actually don't contradict Islam. For example, the image of God, that's in, uh, in Hadith that Adam was uh, created in the image of God. But there are many things that uh, actually Christians believe which uh, uh, go against the Old Testament. For example, the, the Old Testament says in Deuteronomy 6.4, there's, there's only one God, but Christians believe in three gods. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2 says that the Messiah is only a human being. It says the Messiah will fear, will delight in the fear of God, but Christians uh, think Messiah is God. Ezekiel 18 says only the sinner can be punished for the sin, but Christians believe in sacrificial atonement. The Old Testament says that uh, we must keep the Torah, but Christians say there is no Torah. Christians even disagree with Jesus. For example, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, he says, Think not that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I've come not to destroy, but to fulfill. And But Christians preach a different gospel. Muslims actually have the same idea that you have to keep the law, but Christians, they come with a different law. Jesus said that he's not God. For example, John 17, verse 3, he said, the Father is the only one who is God, but Christians believe in three gods. So uh, actually, the Quranic message is in line with the prophets, but the Christian message contradicts the prophets. He said Isaiah 42 is Israel. First of all, that contradicts um, that contradicts the Gospel of Matthew, for example, which says Jesus the, uh, is uh the fulfillment of Isaiah 42. And many many scholars don't take Isaiah 42 to be Israel. And many scholars actually take Isaiah 42 to be Cyrus. So this idea that he has to be an Israelite, many scholars don't believe in that. Academic scholars and rabbis like uh, John Collins, the Yale Anchor Bible Commentary, the Targum, the New American Commentary, the Nikot Commentary, they all take it as individuals. Some the Messiah, some uh, Cyrus, some even take it as the prophet, like the Deut Isaiah. One proof that it's not uh, Israel is that uh, at the end, it talks about Israel as the servant and it describes Israel as deaf and blind and dumb, etc. But in the beginning, the first servant is freeing Israel from deafness, from blindness, etc. Also in Isaiah 42, the servant frees them, from, uh, frees the people in dungeons and prisons, etc. But at the end of Isaiah 42, it's Israel that's described as being in dungeons, etc. Because why the uh, servant of Isaiah 42 uh, frees them from either spiritual darkness or you could take it as freeing them from exile. Uh, he said the sacred stone in the Kaaba, etc. is idolatry. This is the same thing as in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 5 to 7. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of uh, unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the Sepharim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. So uh, a coal atones a sin in Isaiah as well. Muslims don't believe that the stone has some magical properties, etc. It's only following the Prophet Muhammad that we do it. Umar literally said that we don't believe the stone has any power to harm or benefit. A uh, bunch of other things. So I'll just go. So Deuteronomy 33 verse 2 was brought up. Uh, he said that it's describing the events of the Exodus. No, it's not. Habakkuk chapter 3 is a parallel passage to Deuteronomy 33 2, and it's in the future tense. This is Ellicott's commentary on Habakkuk 3. Quote, they all refer to a scene really future, but brought by the grasp of faith into the immediate present. In the Hebrew, some of these verbs are in the future tense, others in the past used with the force of a present, the prophetic perfect, as it is sometimes termed. And by the way, the root of the Exodus, look at any map, was Sinai, then Paran, then Sire. But in Deuteronomy 33-2, it's Sinai, then Sire, then Paran. And the order is important because it's represented by the rising of the sun, which indicates time, among other things. And uh, he said, how do we know it's a prophet? Well, when it says Sinai, well, Sinai is Moses. So yes, 
prophetic. You can understand some of it as talking about prophets. Uh, Deuteronomy 18, he said it's just about the prophets in general, like the prophets being set up in Israel. Moses explicitly refutes that in Deuteronomy 34.10. He says, and there arose not since then in Israel a prophet like Moses. Whether Moses or Joshua wrote this verse, it must be understood as prophetic past tense. In other words, the meaning of this verse is there will never arise in Israel a prophet like Moses. Because if Moses or Joshua wrote it, it wouldn't make sense that they're comparing Moses to prophets who haven't come yet. Uh, because at their time, like prophets hadn't come, but this verse implies many prophets have come. So it's actually prophetic past tense, meaning there will never arise in Israel a prophet like Moses. So the prophet of Deuteronomy 18 cannot arise from Israel. He has to arise from one of the brother nations. Uh, Deuteronomy 2, for example, uh, calls the Edomites the brother nation of the uh, Israelites. Genesis 16 calls Ishmael the brothers of the other nations. Um, as for Deuteronomy 17.15, so this is often quoted to say that the brother of Israel can be Israel. Uh, because in Deuteronomy 18.15, uh, Israel is spoken of as one person. It says the prophet will come from your brothers and yours in the singular, which would mean the prophet comes from Israel's brothers. And that doesn't make any sense unless he's coming from a brother nation. Just like if I say I'm going to give Samuel's brother money, everyone knows I'm not giving Samuel, Samuel money. I'm giving it to someone else. So Deuteronomy 17 is often quoted to refute that. But Deuteronomy 17 are not the words of Moses, as many uh, scholars like Thomas, uh, like Tom Stark have mentioned. There are many things that prove this. For example, in Deuteronomy 17, there's a whole polemic, like the king cannot have many wives, lest, it, lest his heart be led astray. But in 2 Samuel 12, 8, God brags to David about how he blessed him with many wives. So that orig originally, kings were allowed to have many wives. But what happened is uh, 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 the Israelites thought that Solomon had many wives and that led him to start worshiping Id uh, idols, etc. So the authors of Deuteronomy 17 added, added these laws in to like restrict the kings from having uh, many wives. And this is also clear, like the Jewish study Bible mentions Deuteronomy 17 presupposes the reign of Solomon because the sins mentioned in Deuteronomy 17 of the king, they all uh, match what Solomon did according to the Bible. It mentions that he cannot have many wives that his heart may be led astray. He cannot have horses. He cannot go back to Egypt to have horses. He cannot accumulate wealth. And this is all stuff that Solomon did. It's reacting to Solomon's reign. These are not the words of Moses. It doesn't make any sense to say the brother of Israel is, is Israel. It's common sense. The brother of someone is someone else. Uh, I don't remember if he brought up satanic verses. Uh, if he did, uh, it's in authentic. Ibn Khuzayma is an example. He was a contemporary to Bukhari, uh, a Hadith specialist. And he mentioned that all these narrations are fabricated by heretics. There's not a single authentic narration that goes back to companion. They're all mursal, which means they're anonymous. The authentic ones are anonymous. So they're not actually authentic because they're anonymous. Um, the ones that do go back to companions don't mention anything about satanic versus just prostrating. All right. So he mentioned this um, hadith about the prophet making a false prophecy that uh, the hour will not come. If you go to just the hadith before, it's uh, Sahih Muslim 2952. Just before, the, the wording there, and this is, I believe, the wording in Bukhari as well, is... Uh, until your hour would come to you and uh, I think so in Bukhari as well uh, the prophet says so this is Bukhari 6511 it says which means your hour so uh, this makes like one of the things that orientalists Muslims everyone agrees is that the Quran uh, the hadith for it to be authentic it has to agree with the Quran everyone agrees that the Quran is first Right? So if something in a hadith contradicts the Qur'an, it's not authentic. The Qur'an over and over again says that the Prophet Muhammad doesn't know when the hour is. For example, uh, Surah 7, Ayah 187, I think it is. Let me just uh, check the exact reference. Um, at the end of Surah 67 as well, it mentions the Prophet Muhammad doesn't have any clue about the hour. Yeah, Surah 7, 187. They ask you about the hour. When is it? Say, its knowledge is only with my Lord. So uh, the correct version of that hadith is the one which says Sa'atukum, which means your hour, meaning when you will die. Uh, because Sa'atukum means basically when you will die, etc. That's how it's understood. Uh, other things. So he says the Holy Spirit is mentioned in uh, John 16. Uh, and so it has to be the Holy Spirit. But the Jews could use the term Holy Spirit for a human being. This is proven because in the uh, assumption of Moses, Moses is called the Holy Spirit. And the assumption of Moses is a first century text. It shows you how Jews spoke. The Holy Spirit in John 14 to 16 cannot be, the, uh, the Holy Spirit has to be a person because uh, Jesus says that he has to leave for the Holy Spirit to come, for the paraclete to come. But Jesus gave them the paraclete while he was still there in John 20. 
Jesus gave them the Holy Spirit while he was still there in John 20. So this is a different Holy Spirit. This is a person. Also, uh, masculine pronouns are used for the paraclete, including when he's talked about as the spirit. Uh, and everywhere else in the New Testament, the spirit is spoken of with neutral pronouns. This is what Raymond Brown says. The masculine pronouns, ikainos and autos, are used of the spirit in uh, John 14, etc. Uh, 26, 16, 7, 8, 13, 14. As the paraclete, the spirit takes on a more personal role than in other sections of the New Testament. So what a coincidence. In John 16, the description doesn't match the Holy Spirit. And then masculine pronouns are used anyway. And Holy Spirit could be used for a human being. Um and uh, this is what uh, Robert M. Price says. There's some reason to think that Jesus is predicting another human being to follow him to explain his teachings more. Because early, some early Christians thought Paul was the paraclete. Others said Marcion or Montanus or Priscilla or Aquila or Alcasai or Mani. And then finally, Muslims said Muhammad was the paraclete. I have to admit there are some strengths to that theory. Origen mentioned that his disciples believed Paul was the paraclete. And other people like uh, Tertullian, I believe, as well, believed Montanus was the paraclete. Um... Let's see, uh, Genesis uh, 17, it's connected to Genesis 12, because in Genesis 12, which is an obvious spiritual promise, it's told that Abraham is turned into a great nation, and that's applied in Genesis 17. And in Genesis 17, Abraham asked for Ishmael to live before God, so it's a spiritual promise. Also, Genesis 17, the covenant part there, I didn't quote Genesis 17. Genesis 12 and 17 are different promises uh, in terms of the part about the uh, covenant. The covenant part is not in Genesis 12. Genesis 15, 17 are two different covenants, and by the time. way. All right. Thank you very much for that. Mr. Green, your time will start uh, when you begin speaking. Um, let me just get to here. Thank you, Ibrahim, for that interaction with my, um, with my presentation. So you began with Daniel chapter 2, and that is indeed a prophecy of the coming kingdom of God. And you said that uh, there are four kingdoms that are spelt out, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, and that the kingdom of God comes um, and you know, comes after that fourth kingdom. And you, your point was that, that that's Islam. Now, there are two reasons why that's not the case. Uh, the first is that it's an eternal kingdom. It's the eternal kingdom, which in Daniel chapter 12 is said to be the resurrection kingdom of God. And it's Jesus who is resurrected and begins that resurrection kingdom. That's that's what the Bible says. So it's Jesus who brings that resurrection kingdom. And also uh, Daniel chapter 7 shows that the one who who brings this is the son of man. And the Son of Man is the way that Jesus identified himself. He calls himself the Son of Man again and again. And the Son of Man knows what's going to happen to him. He knows that he's going to be taken into the presence of God. And that's that's the way Jesus speaks. He speaks of himself as being brought into the presence of God. So if we let the Bible interpret itself, it's the resurrection kingdom from Daniel 12. Jesus brings that resurrection kingdom uh, so it, it's Jesus who comes in the time of the Roman Empire and sets up God's resurrection kingdom. Um, you made a few reference. Uh, you made a reference to Isaiah nine, verse seven, and that's a very famous prophecy. But if we just read it, we actually see in verse seven that it says it's David's throne, and so it's a son of David that it's speaking about. This was also the case with Isaiah chapter twenty-two. Uh, verse 22, where it talks of, uh, where it talks about the key of David being given to this person. These are all ways of speaking about the Messiah, who is the son of David. This comes from 2 Samuel chapter um, 7, uh, where the covenant is made with King David, that his son will be the son of God and God will be his father. And there is this promise that there will always be a son of David ruling over God's kingdom. And so these are prophecies about sitting on David's throne, about David's son ruling. And so it's not, you know, it's actually telling you the genealogy, the family that it's going to come from. And it's not from, from Ishmael, it's actually from David's line. And uh, the book of Revelation, so in the New Testament, chapter 3, verse 7, explicitly says that Jesus has this key of David. You spoke about, uh, the, the, the 
this the sign the key I, I, it was the I can't remember what phrase you used but you said that uh, Muhammad's mole on his shoulder was evidence that he was this this figure well I just want to say that having a mole on your back is not really a valid prophetic proof many people have moles on their bodies and I I, I just don't see that as linking into these prophecies at all that's a different thing uh, you spoke about Isaiah 9 saying that the Midianites were defeated with the coming of this person. Well, the Midianites were Ishmaelites. Um, so I, I guess you could work that in somehow. Uh, but it's talking about the, the the hostile Ishmaelites being subjugated by this person. Uh, you've got, you made the point that Islam liberated the Jews. Well, I don't think the Jews would really say that. They certainly, they would, they swapped their overlords for Roman overlords to now Muslim overlords. And if you read the history, they were part of the Vimy people. They had to pay the terms of surrender. And so they weren't really liberated. They're just subjugated under new overlords. The Romans were just replaced by the by the, uh, by the Muslims, that, that they certainly weren't liberated. They're certainly not on the same level as Muslims. They're part of the Vimy. Um, Isaiah 19, verse 21, you spoke about the prophecy where it speaks about Egypt and Assyria worshipping the Lord. And uh, I want to say, yeah, this is a great prophecy. But again, it's very clear that the name here is they're going to worship the Lord. Uh, and that is the name Yahweh. And this is something that the Quran just doesn't have. Like Muhammad prophesied in the name of a different God. He didn't prophesy in the name of Yahweh. And it's the name of Yahweh that is says it's going to be exalted. It says Yahweh will be exalted. And it, it's just a different name. It's like the name Zeus or you know something else. It's, it's a different name. And and but the people who did recognize this name were the Christians. Now, yes, they were conquered, but okay, we live in difficult times. But the people who confessed the name of Yahweh, myself, are Christians. We're the ones. Uh, and remember that the Assyrians converted to Christianity, the Egyptians converted to Christianity, and they were the ones who confessed the name of Yahweh. Isaiah chapter uh, twenty nine. Oh, I, I sort of dealt with that in my talk where. You, you're saying that it's, you know, people will hear the scroll. Um, but as I pointed out in Isaiah chapter 29, verse 11, it's referring to the scroll of Isaiah itself. And Isaiah chapter 6 is explicit that God had blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, but that there was going to be a time when their eyes would see and they would hear this scroll and understand it. And it's referring to the scroll of Isaiah and Jesus in um, Matthew 13, sorry, Matthew, Matthew 13, um, and and Matthew and Mark and the parallel passages, he explicitly quotes this part of Isaiah and says, "I'm revealing this this mystery." So, if we're doing it according to the Bible, then that's how the Bible interprets it. It says that it's Jesus who uh, is opening the eyes, and as I said, Jesus does his miracles to show that he is opening the eyes to show that he is the genuine one bringing what Isaiah promised. Uh, so it's referring to the, the scroll of Isaiah, not to the Quran. That's just what it says in, con in context. Um, Isaiah 42, you referred to, and um, I dealt with that in my talk, J just to say that the Bible says it refers to Matthew. Now, you, you brought up that it can't be Matthew. I'll actually do this little part from your rebuttal here. You're saying that it can't be Matthew because, sorry, it can't be Jesus because Matthew says it's Jesus. And I was saying Isaiah 42 was about Israel. Okay, so I was saying Isaiah 42 was about Israel. And then I said, this is identified as Jesus in Matthew 12. And you're saying, well, who is it, Jesus or, uh, or Israel? Well, the point here is that Jesus comes as the true Israelite. The, the Gospels tell a story that Jesus is the true Israelite, that he's actually God coming to perfect the nation of Israel and perfect what Israel should do. And so in the book of Isaiah, as you correctly brought up, you brought up that, 
that there's the that there's one of the servants in the book of Isaiah who is deaf and blind. You know, in Isaiah 42, he's deaf and blind and doesn't do what he's supposed to do. But then there's the servant who does do what he's supposed to do. And so this is the faithful remnant. This is the true servant of the Lord who fulfills Israel's destiny. And so Jesus is presented in the gospel as the true Israelite. He's, um, he's born of a miraculous birth in the way that Sarah had a miraculous birth to make the nation of Israel. He, Jesus goes into Egypt as Israel went into Egypt. Pharaoh killed the baby boys. Herod killed the baby boys around Jesus. Jesus goes into the desert for 40 days, being tested as Israel was tested for 40 years in the wilderness. And so Jesus' life is paralleled to Israel's. He is the true Israelite. And so that's how Jesus and Israel uh, fit together. Um, you referred to Genesis 12 and said uh, that it, you know, it does not only refer to Isaac, but I've shown where it sp explicitly says that the covenant does refer to Isaac. And uh, you brought up in your rebuttal that the that it's a separate covenant, that there's the covenant of chapter 12 and uh, Genesis chapter 12, and then the covenant in chapter 17. No, they're the same covenant. And when you actually read them, they will both say things like, through you I will bless all nations. So they're the same covenant that's being spoken about. There's the one covenant given in chapter 12, and then it's reiterated at different times, and then it's specifically said to go to Isaac. Now, God blesses Ishmael. He blesses Esau. He blesses the other children. He blesses all the children of Abraham. But the covenant, the Bible explicitly says, goes to Esau. Um, now, in Malachi, you said that it refers to Muhammad coming to the temple. Well, as we, you sort of pointed this out, there was no temple at that time. There was no temple that had been destroyed. And uh, it it actually, um, it, it's not just a prophecy about the, about the Lord coming, the messenger of the Lord. It's actually about the prophet Elijah coming to prepare the way for the Lord. So it's about two people coming. It's about one person who is the Elijah and then the Lord coming. So this is in Malachi 3 and Malachi 4 verse 5. So there's two people. You can't just have one. You've got to have both. And one comes and prepares the way and introduces the other. And the gospel makes this very clear that it's John the Baptist comes in the spirit of Elijah, uh, in the way that Elijah's spirit went from Elijah to Elisha. It comes to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist introduces Jesus. And th the gospels make it very clear that uh, they quote Malachi 3 and say that it's being fulfilled with John the Baptist and Jesus. My last point here is, what have I got here? Oh, yeah, you referred to the parable that Jesus said in Matthew 21, verse uh, 43, where it spoke about the kingdom being handed over to a different group of people. Well, if we read the gospel, we see that that's referring to Jesus' disciples. But more importantly, in chapter 21, verse 37, in the very parable that you referred to, it talks about this person being the son. And so there's the prophets in the parable but then there's the son who comes. And so it's Jesus actually giving a parable of himself being the son of God. And so that's not referring to uh, Muhammad. So um, thank you for that. And so just to reiterate my points for the last few minutes, um, Muhammad doesn't fit into the story of the Bible. There are no verses in the Bible predicting a prophet like Muhammad. And finally, the Bible warns us not to follow a prophet like him for the reasons I've given. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. So we're going to start the second round of rebuttals. And uh, Ibrahim, your time will start when you're ready. All right. So uh, the first thing he said is the name of Yahweh, etc. Um, so the Quran explicitly confirms that it's from the same God who revealed the Torah. Quote, indeed, we set down the Torah, Surah 5, Ayah 44. Obviously, then, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, speaks in the name of the God of the Torah. And the Quran even alludes to the name Yahweh because it puns on the name of Zechariah in Surah 19, Ayah 1 and Surah 341. 
For example, Surah 19, Ayah 1 says, this is a remembrance of the mercy of your Lord to his slave Zechariah. And the name of Zechariah means the Lord remembers or Yahweh remembers. Another such pun is uh, Surah 37, Ayah 126. It's, it's just that Yahweh in the pun has been replaced with Lord, which the New Testament does, the Septuagint does, majority Bible translations do, uh, and rabbis also don't say Yahweh. The claim that if you don't literally say Yahweh, this means you don't speak in the name of Yahweh is ridiculous. Jews don't say Yahweh either because they consider it to be too holy, but no one would doubt that they speak in the name of Yahweh. Uh, if uh, Dwayne Johnson sent me as an agent to Samuel, and I come to Samuel and say, I've been sent by The Rock, right? Will anyone doubt that I've come in the name of Dwayne Johnson? No, I don't need to literally say Dwayne Johnson. Everyone knows The Rock and Dwayne Johnson are the same person. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 20, refers to God as Ha Elohim, which is the Hebrew equi equivalent of Allah. And uh, by the way, just this name Yahweh, anyway, Exodus 6, 6, 3 says that, Exodus chapter 6, verse 3 says, the patriarchs didn't know the name Yahweh, so it's not uh, necessary uh, anyway. Um, so uh, he said that he, he'll quote like the Bible saying Jesus is the fulfillment of this, the fulfillment of this. The Bible gives different interpretations many times. For example, he said that the Bible says that uh, Jesus is the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 18. But if you read Jeremiah chapter 1, Deuteronomy 18 is applied to him. But if you uh, And if you read the book of Joshua, Deuteronomy 18 is applied to Joshua. So it's not so simple as, oh, it's Jesus. It's all coming to Jesus. The Bible often has different opinions. And that's why uh, there were rabbis who thought Jeremiah is the prophet like Moses and uh, Joshua is the prophet like Moses. Uh, um. So uh, let's see. So he, he tried to apply many of these prophecies to Jesus. Let's see how Jesus doesn't fulfill any of them. So Daniel 2 is talking about a kingdom coming and destroying the previous empires, including the Roman Empire. Jesus didn't bring a kingdom. Yes, the Christians converted. Uh, they set up a church. They converted the Roman exiles, the Romans, sorry. That's not bringing a new kingdom. That's just converting them. But in Daniel, there's a new kingdom coming after the Roman Empire. Historically, that was the Islamic Empire. Jesus didn't rule. Isaiah 9, he brought up David's throne, etc., I'll get to this later. But one thing is that Jesus didn't sit on David's throne. He didn't sit on it either. And uh, Jesus, by the way, confirms that the Messiah is not the son of David. This is what he says in Matthew. Uh, who is, uh, let's see, he asks people, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? They say the son of David. And he said, how is he the son of David when he basically calls David my master or David calls him my master? And then he says, if David calls him master, how can he be his son? So, the, Jesus is explicitly saying that the Davidic uh, Messiah business is corrupted. Um, so he says that the Jews wouldn't say that the Muslims liberated them. Let me just read you uh, some of the stuff that actual historical sources about what Jews at that time say. So this is from the secrets of Rabbi Shimon bin Yohai. It's an early text from uh, this rabbi. And he says, do not be afraid, mortal, for the Holy One. This is an angel talking to him uh, in, in the text. For the Holy One, blessed be he, is bringing about the kingdom of Ishmael only for the purpose of delivering you from that wicked one, Edom, meaning the Romans. He will raise over them a prophet in accordance with his will, and he will subdue the land for them, and they will come and restore it with grandeur. Uh, here's another one. So this is actually a scholar, David Warnstein. He mentions in his talk, uh, uh, so what did the Muslims do for the Jews? He says, Islam saved Jewry. This is an unpopular, discomforting claim in the modern world, but it is the historical truth. He says, had Islam not come along, Jewry in the West would have declined to disappearance, and Jewry in the East would have become just another Orientalist, Oriental cult. Um, he says other stuff as well. So this is what Moshe Gill mentions on A History of Palestine. He quotes this rabbi saying, as we know, the temple remained in the hands of the Romans for more than 500 years, and they did not succeed in entering Jerusalem. And anyone who did and was recognized as a Jew was put to death. But when the Romans left it, by the mercy of the God of Israel, the kingdom of Ishmael was victorious. Israel was permitted to come and to live. And there's a lot of stuff like this. I quoted uh, another rabbi in the beginning as well. So yeah, today there's conflict. But in the past, especially at that time, it was different. Uh, he said the, the, book of, uh, the book in Isaiah 29, 18 is... Um, is, is the book of Isaiah. No, again, it lacks a definite article. Uh, this is what Pulpit's commentary mentions. Um, uh, no particular book is intended, Sefer being without the article. So they've taken the, without the article to mean that it doesn't need to be a specific book, but because there's no article, it can be any book. It, you could Any book that fulfills it, as a revelation could, from God, fulfills it. Because if you want to connect it to verse 12, right, 
then if there was a definite article, you would have a better case to do that. And, and by the way, this idea of a sealed book is in Daniel as well. So just because in verse 12, something is mentioned as a sealed book doesn't have to mean the book of Isaiah. Um, Okay, I forgot what I was going to say. But uh, anyway, the Yale Anchor Bible commentary also mentions that we are not told what the book, namely the scroll, is from that someone will read aloud uh, to the formerly deaf. Um, they, they say that because it lacks the article. Um, let's see, other stuff. So he said that there was no temple at the time of, uh, of the Prophet Muhammad. I, I dealt with that. Ezra chapter 2, verse 68. Does, doesn't need the temple, temple, the word temple can refer to the land or the ruins of the temple. Um, he says that uh, Malachi chapter 3, it's two people. Even if you take it as two people, the one preparing the way uh, could be interpreted as this Jesus or whatever. But uh, actually, many, many scholars take it as one person, such as John Collins. It cannot be Jesus and John the Baptist, really. Uh, that's why I take it as one person. And the New Testament cannot fulfill it because Isaiah 40 literally begins by telling you the exile is about to end. It says, uh, comfort, comfort Jerusalem, says your God, speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Proclaim to her that her service has been paid for, her sin has been paid for, she is received from the hand of the Lord, double for all her sins. You read throughout Deuteronomy Isaiah, the exile, it's about the exile ending. Isaiah 42, same thing, an exile is ending. Uh, even if you want to interpret 42 as not talking about an exile, but that's the theme of the book. What happened when Jesus came? They rejected him, and as punishment, God exiled the Jews. So it's Jesus is the complete opposite of Isaiah 42 and uh, Malachi chapter 3. And even Isaiah uh, 29, 32, 35, again, for example, in 35, it mentioned an exile is ending. I discussed that. What happened? When Jesus came, they were exiled. It's the complete opposite. Isaiah 9, they're saved from foreign oppression. Jesus, what did he do? When he came, they were rejected. And as a punishment, God sent the Romans to destroy them. Uh, let me just get uh, to David's throne here. Um, let's see. Okay, so one thing I'll mention regarding uh, David's throne is that the verse doesn't need to be translated as he will sit on David's throne. Uh, it can simply be translated as he will bring peace to David's throne. This is, in other words, Palestine. Uh, many translate it this way, including the Yale Anchor Bible Commentary, the NRSV, the Common English Bible, and the Complete Jewish Bible. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he came, the Muslims literally conquered all of David's kingdom. So yes, that is uh, a perfect fulfillment. Compare this to Jesus, on the other hand, who never conquered uh, David's kingdom, uh, never conquered Palestine, nor did his disciples. And by the way, sitting on the throne doesn't need to be taken literally. Matthew 23 describes the Pharisees as sitting on Moses' seat. Again, that's not literal. The Muslims united David's kingdom after it split, the north and south split. And um, for a thousand years, they were under pagan rule. It's only the Muslims that brought them back. They united them under God's law. Also, the part about him establishing David's kingdom, there's a variant in 1Q ISA, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the International Critical Commentary mentions that this variant can be interpreted as meaning the child is the one being established. Also, yeah, the Muslims are the inheritors of David's kingdom. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 proves this because it talks about the temple as his temple, meaning the temple of the messenger of the covenant. Why? Because the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the custodian of the temple and he led the prophets in prayer there. And by extension, he's the custodian of Jerusalem and David's kingdom. And Daniel 2 proves this as well because it talks about the Muslim empire as the kingdom of God. Also, one way to interpret Matthew 21 is that the right to Jerusalem will go to another nation, which was the Ishmael nation. How do we know? Because the vineyard can be understood as Jerusalem. Why? Because it talks about uh, the sun being thrown out of the vineyard, meaning thrown out of Jerusalem, right? Everyone knows that. If you, if you know commentaries, you would know what that means. So the vineyard can be interpreted as, as Jerusalem. In other words, the right to Jerusalem is being given to another nation. And so it was given to the Ishmaelites. So if the Ishmaelites are the uh, inheritors of Jerusalem, by extension, we're the inheritors of Daniel, uh, of uh, David's kingdom as well. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Uh, Daniel 2, he said the kingdom forever, etc. First of all, Forever doesn't need to be literally taken as forever. Psalm 45 talks about the king's dominion being established forever. That's not literal. Psalm 110 also says you are a priest established forever. It's not literal. Uh, pro and by the way, prophecies tend to use hyperbole. For example, Isaiah 45 verse 17 say, it says that Israel was saved forever. The age is everlasting. Speaking about Cyrus saving Israel from Babylon. Yet uh, Israel was invaded after that by, for example, the Romans. You read many commentaries, they'll mention that uh, there's a lot of hyperbole anyway. So we don't even need to take that literally. Even though we do actually, there are narrations that talk about the Prophet Muhammad is at the beginning of this nation and Jesus is at its end. So it is forever. And just because, uh, and uh, Jesus did not establish any kingdom. Uh, he, so he did not establish the Roman kingdom. The Messianic kingdom is not here. If it was Jesus' kingdom, where is he? 
where's the messianic kingdom? It's not here. Jesus is still going to come and bring the kingdom according to Christians, etc. Um, and right, uh, Daniel speaks about, uh, he says that the, when the rock comes, it will smash the idol, which means he's considering the first nations, Greece, uh, and Babylon as if they still exist. So just because an empire changes forms doesn't mean it no longer exists. So the Islamic empire changing forms does not mean it uh, no longer exists. Um, let's see. Um, so the covenant with Isaac, it's not the same covenant. See, in Genesis 15, uh, God gives Abraham a covenant Right, and then Genesis 17, uh, 17 is years later. It's after Ishmael has been born, and then he gives them another covenant. This one is only for Isaac's nation. Genesis twelve, on the other hand, is not a covenant anyway. It's actually a promise. So there's a promise. Then there's covenant one. Then there's covenant two. You only covenant two is only with Isaac, which by the way later came to the Ishmaelites because of Matthew twenty one forty three. But Genesis 12 is not the covenant is covenant two. It's just a promise. And Genesis 15 also never says it's only with Isaac. This is what uh, uh, this is what Paul R. Williamson says in his book, Abraham, Israel, and the Nations, the Patriarchal Promise, etc. Uh, so this is uh, beginning of chapter five. He says that regarding chapter 17, the fact that throughout this chapter, the covenant is spoken of in the future tense cannot be ignored or that, actually that's page 202. And at the beginning of chapter five, he says, uh, the fact that this particular covenant, rather than simply some aspect of the divine promises, is spoken of in the future tense, is surely significant. This covenant is apparently being presented in the final form of Genesis, at least as a different one from that that's been depicted in Genesis 15. Also, Matthew 21, 43 said the son, etc. The son there just means because Jesus is a king, because he's Messiah. Like Psalm 2 mentions that, uh, uh, talks about a king and it calls him the son. Because in Israelite language, the son, the king could be described as a son of God. So the difference between Jesus and the other prophets is he's a king. That's why he's called son in Matthew 21. All right. And time. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Mr. Green, when you're ready, your time will start for the final rebuttal. Okay. Let me just get this. 19. Hang on. Thank you for that, Ibrahim. I'll go through your rebuttal um, from the two that you've just given there. Uh, so the first one was you brought up the point of Muhammad doing miracles and you quoted verses which speak about signs. Uh, there are, the word for signs is used in three different ways in the Quran. First of all, the verses of the Quran are called signs. Then there's the acts of God in creation are called signs. And then there's the miracles of the prophets. Now, the Quran says explicitly 13 times that Muhammad did no miracle. One of the ones that Ibrahim brought up was Surah 54, verse 2, where it talks about the splitting of the moon. And it says, if they see a sign, they won't believe. The verse actually doesn't say they saw a sign. It says, if they see a sign. The Arabic's clear, if they see a sign. And all the other verses which speak about Muhammad not giving signs chronologically come after Surah 54, right? That's just the standard chronology of the, of the verses. So we have 13 verses after Surah 54 saying Muhammad did no miracles. So the, the Quran is clear, Muhammad did no miracles. Now, as Ibrahim brought up, hadiths need to be accepted or rejected as to whether or not they agree with the Quran. And I, uh, he, he was saying that, um, we're talking about Muhammad predicting the coming hour, and he was saying that the Quran makes it clear that Muhammad didn't know the hour, and so all these hadiths about him knowing the hour are clearly false. I'll, I'll say, okay, maybe that's a, a good answer. I accept that answer. Um, I'm always wanted to know. I'm always wanted to go from the Quran to know what Muhammad is thinking rather than the hadith. But when the hadiths have Muhammad doing all these miracles and the Quran saying he doesn't, that's what well, I've got to go with. Your next point was that the Jews were expecting um, a prophet, uh, the Messiah and Elijah. Well, jo as I said, John the Baptist is the Elijah and Jesus is identified as the prophet in John chapter 16. In John chapter 6, it actually says, this is the prophet. Uh, I think it's verse 14. They explicitly say, this is the prophet. So again, the question today is, 
according to the Bible, you know, is Muhammad foretold in it? And if we let the Bible tell us who the prophet like Moses is, then it's Jesus. That's just what it says. Just as King David was both the messianic figure and a prophet, so too Jesus is this prophet. In fact, the book of Isaiah even talks about the, the Messiah as a prophet, a prophetic figure. You mentioned that in the Hadith, uh, the idea of the image of God is there. That is true, but it's not in the Quran. In fact, Surah 42 verse 11 says, there is nothing like Allah. There is no one like Allah. And so on that basis, many Muslims I know reject the idea of the image of God because of that. You said that Christians believe in three gods. Uh, no, we don't. We believe in one God who is a higher order personal being. Right. So this is the doctrine of the Trinity. It's not really the subject, but uh, we believe that God is a higher order personal being. The problem, problems people have with the Trinity is when they use their own experience of being a person to say what is logical about God. But we can't make ourselves a model for what God should be like. God is a higher order personal being. Um, you said that we make Jesus God. Well, again, that's this the incarnation, and maybe we could debate the incarnation and Trinity sometime. Uh, but Isaiah 40 and elsewhere in Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah 56, God says that he is going to come and do what we have failed to do. And all of the Gospels begin with Isaiah 40 saying that God has come to us in Christ. And so that's our grounds for saying that. Uh, you said that uh, the idea that, um, that, that there's this co constant teaching all the way through the scriptures, uh, you know, it isn't true because I, Ezekiel 18 says that one man can't pay for the sins of others. Well, there's a few things there. First of all, Ezekiel 18 is talking about sinful people and it's saying one sinner cannot bear the sins of another sinner. We fully accept that, fully accept it. If you keep reading in Ezekiel, you'll see that it talks about sacrifices of atonement and that is where a sacrifice is offered on behalf of someone else and so when once you start putting all these pictures together you do have representation in the way that the christians understand it so uh, you've got to read all of ezekiel in fact ezekiel the end of ezekiel chapter 16 says that god is the one who's going to provide the sacrifice of atonement for us so we need to read all of Ezekiel to see how it comes together. You said that uh, it's Muslims who keep the, the law, not Christians. Again, following this same theme where Jesus said that he uh, came to keep the law. Um, what, it actually says that Jesus came to fulfill the law, and that is he comes to fulfill it through his obedience. And so as Christians, we, we know that we ourselves can't keep the law. Jesus fulfills it for us. We still obey the law, but not as a way of approaching God, but but just as, as God's commands. But we still keep the law. Obviously, we don't keep the sacrificial law anymore now because that's been fulfilled through the death of Jesus. So this, uh, we keep all of it, but some of it's been fulfilled in Jesus. And so we don't practice those bits which have been fulfilled because Jesus has done them. You spoke about Isaiah 42 and saying that, uh, you know, it can't be Jesus because oh, I'm just looking for what you actually said there. Let's see. Um, uh, you're saying that uh, I, I think that was the idea that I brought up before, that I um, that it, th that difference between Israel and and Jesus and how does Israel and Jesus fit together. And as I showed there in the in the book of Isaiah, there's the righteous Israel and the faithless Israel. And Jesus is that uh righteous Israel. Uh, Isaiah 6, you, you said that Isaiah 6 is the equivalent of kissing the black stone. No, it's not. In the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, it's a sacrificial altar that Isaiah sees, an altar which makes atonement. And so you, you've actually got to read the verses. It's it's a sacrificial altar in the in his vision which was part of the part of the standard practices in the temple where sacrifices were being made on behalf of other people. So a substitutionary sacrifice was being made for the forgiveness of sins. I mean, Isaiah 6 is actually the gospel. It's actually teaching Christianity that you can have a, a, an altar with a sacrifice which takes away your sin. And so 
from the altar comes a, a hot coal, it touches his lips, and his sins are atoned for. That's actually Christian doctrine and the idea of sacrifice. It's, it's not what we see with the kissing of the black stone and with the reference which you, you could go back and look at where it talks about seeking Allah's blessing from the stone. Um, Deuteronomy 32, I think that's the, the one with the different locations. Again, they're locations. They're not said to be prophets. Okay, Israel went to Sinai. It, it doesn't mean that Sinai represents a prophet. It means that, that that is part of their journey. And so I want to just stay with that. Um, Deuteronomy 18, uh, you said it by the end of Deuteronomy, it says that there was no prophet raised up uh, in Israel like that. Well, that's where it changes with Jesus. Like Deuteronomy says, God has raised no one like this. But as soon as you get to the gospel, you meet the one who has been raised up and who does fulfill that last chapter of Isaiah of of um of Deuteronomy, uh, because Jesus does the miracles that Moses did. He he in, in, you know he in fact he does more. He raises the dead. He feeds people in the wilderness. Uh, the idea that the references to the brothers means it, it's not you, it's your brother. No no, it, it's talking about your brother Israelites. So when it says the king must be from your brothers, it's not saying that the Israelites are to go to other nations to get their kings. That's just not reading in context. It's just not what the words mean. It's very clear, and I gave the references there, it, the priests come from the brother Israelites. The kings come from the brother Israelites. Deuteronomy 18 says, I will raise up a prophet from your brothers. In the context, that's just what it means. You mentioned the satanic verses. I didn't bring that up. But certainly Ibn Tamir and significant Islamic scholars accept it. That the reason they accept it is that all of the Sahaba accepted the story. And it's in all the early accounts of Ibn Ishaq, uh, Ibn Sa'd. And the, there are scholars you can read that. I've, I've debated that before and I've got an article where you can actually go through them. Um, but there are significant Islamic scholars who accept it. Uh, you, you mentioned the Holy Spirit and... And I was showing that the Holy Spirit in the Quran matches almost perfectly the description of the Holy Spirit that Jesus says in John 14, and that that is a much more sensible uh, understanding of what Jesus is saying and, and of, of how Islam should accept it. Certainly, Muhammad is not called the Holy Spirit. Now, you said that Muhammad, uh, sorry, that in John 14, the, the masculine pronouns are used for the Holy Spirit. No, they're not. They're not used for the Holy Spirit. The, you, you, you can't use grammar that way because the gender of the of the words doesn't indicate always what they are. You know, so for instance, um, you know, in Arabic, things are either masculine or feminine. So you know, they're going to be they're going to be inanimate things which have, have masculine or feminine. And so they're not living, are they? Um, but they've still got a, a gender. When it comes to the pronouns, for the word spirit, pneumatos, it is neuter. And so in Greek, it's masculine, feminine, and neuter. And so for the when it's speaking about the spirit, it uses neuter, uh, uh, neuter pronouns. But when it speaks of the paraclete, paraclete is masculine. And so it uses the masculine pro pronoun. So that's just grammatically correct. It's not making a point about it being a man or not. And as I said, the gospel begins with John the Baptist saying Jesus is going to give the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I'm going to give, send you the Holy Spirit. He goes away. You brought a good point there. You said the Holy Spirit won't come until Jesus goes. He does go. After his uh, crucifixion, he ascends to the Father. He comes back to the disciples. So he has gone. And he has come back. And so if you just keep reading the story, you'll see how that makes sense um, in, in the rest of the story. Jesus has gone. He has come back. And so the Gospel of John ends with Jesus giving those, uh, giving the Holy Spirit. Um, I'm almost out of time. I'll just wrap up with um, what I've got here. No, I'll just say something about the kingdom. Um, the kingdom in the book of Daniel is the kingdom that is the resurrection eternal kingdom. And Islam has not brought the resurrection kingdom. Muhammad was not raised from the dead. Jesus has been raised from the dead, ascended to the right hand of God from where he rules. He has started the resurrection kingdom that will never pass away. 
the kingdom of Israel, of, of Islam, has passed away. And so it's not the kingdom, the resurrection kingdom it's talking about. Thank you very much. All right. Beautiful timing to you both. Thank you very much for that successful round of rebuttals. What we're going to do now is we're going to open it up for questions and answers. Uh, there is going to be priority given to um, Super Chats. So if you guys can, uh, please uh, go ahead and submit those Super Chats over and uh, type out your questions to uh, the chat so I can get it up there. Uh, furthermore, um, I did paste a link onto the uh, StreamYard. However, it looks like it's coming from uh, my alternate account. So if one of the mods had the capabilities of pinning that link, that would be very, very helpful. Um, so uh, right now is the time to submit your questions over to the panelists. And please remember to keep the questions related to the topic of is Muhammad foretold in the Bible? That way that they can address it accordingly. Uh, the first question will be going over to uh, Ibrahim. So uh, these are going to be questions to uh, Ibrahim in regards to the presentation of the topic of today. Uh, and once again, Super Chats will be given priority. So uh, please go ahead and submit the questions via chat. And then if you'd like to come up and ask the panelists, um, the link is here for you guys. <clears throat> For some reason, it's not giving me the ability to pin it, but um, feel free to join us on the the uh, panel. Uh, just know that you will have to be vetted so that your camera will need to be on at the whole time uh, while you're asking the question. And in the meantime, I'm going to be scouring the chat to see if I can grab the question. So this is for Ibrahim. I do see one question for Samuel, so I'm going to table that one yeah. until uh, the questions for Ibrahim come through. That way we can go on a 1-1. One -one. Uh, you can just uh, start with Samuel. Why not? Okay, sure. Hey, that's okay with Samuel. Yeah, of course. You're okay course. with that? Okay, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Do whatever Stop. works with the questions we've got. Okay, fantastic. That's very flexible. So the question is, uh, when did Christianity destroy the four empires? Um, if you happen to know the answer to that question, uh, or mm -hmm. however you want to elaborate on it, it's the floor is yours. Uh, there is a one minute limit, but because of the nature of the question, if you have to go over a little bit, since you guys are both. No, no, good. Um, that's fine. Uh, thank you, Lord Yamka. Uh, the way that we understand that is that Jesus has brought the resurrection kingdom. And so... Jesus, you know, the Gospels say that Jesus is now ascended to the right hand of God and is ruling on high. Now, in, in, I need to sharpen that up a little bit. It didn't destroy the four empires because one came after another. So it's only having to really destroy and take over the last one because the Babylonians were destroyed by the Persians who were destroyed by the Greeks uh, who destroyed by the Romans, you know, so so it's not destroying all four because all four didn't exist at that one time, but that it comes in the fourth and it's the resurrection, eternal kingdom of God. And uh, it ended up taking over the Romans, but it's it's the resurrection kingdom that it's focusing on. Um, I'm not sure that the uh, link is in the chat because... Like I saw someone saying he wants to ask Samuel a question, but he can't find the link. Okay. So here's the link reposted over. Let me see if it comes through. More of the questions are for Samuel. Yeah. Because it's a Muslim stream, so they probably. Yeah. It, right, if right, they're right. mainly for me, then I'm happy just to 
ha- have you and I discuss it or, or, or I don't know, I'm just trying to make it a bit fairer for you as well. Um, uh, obviously, if there's one for you, then have it for you. But we may just need to wing it a bit. If You just want to do like uh, maybe five minutes of rebuttals again, just short five minutes, another um, rebuttal period. Or we could do a discussion period for like t- seven, ten minutes, something like that. Yeah, so... If, um, so there are a couple of guests in the backstage as well, yeah. and there are some more questions. We should answer through. any questions that are there. Um, yeah, I think it would be best if we just, um, if you wanted to provide input. So like, let's say if the question is for Samuel, he can address the main point, you know, take oh, a minute, two okay. minutes. And then if you want to provide any input, you most definitely can. Yeah, okay. So, so I can, um, so we can ask Samuel the questions and then I get a minute to just yeah, respond. Yeah, w- w- why don't we do that? Sure. So uh, I'll start with the first question then. Uh, it was about, the empires. So I'll start now. Yeah. So Christianity didn't destroy uh, any of the empires. Uh, in fact, Christianity is part of the Roman Empire. There was the Roman Empire. Christianity didn't bring a new empire and destroy the Roman Empire. It's part of the Roman Empire. It converted the Roman Empire. So Christians, by consensus, they agree because Jesus said it that the Roman Empire is the final pagan empire before the kingdom of God. Guess what? The Christian, the the empire. Uh, the the Roman Empire is the Christian Empire, so it's explicitly condemned in Daniel. Jesus didn't bring any kingdom, he didn't bring any kingdom. This is just a spiritualizing. This is what Christians do when they can't find fulfillment of prophecy. They just make it into a metaphor. It's spiritual and this and that. No, it's literal. And the Muslims fulfilled it. They act, Prophet Muhammad actually brought an empire. It actually defeated the Roman Empire, uh, it conquered Constantinople, and t- it took all those lands, etc. So that's it. Well, uh, okay, but. The, the resurrection of Jesus, though, was physical. Daniel doesn't say, Daniel 2 and 7 don't say that a Messiah will come and he will be resurrected. Uh, it says that the empires will be ended. But anyway, this is a QA. Yeah. and so. no, no, but No, because you're saying that I'm spiritualizing it and I'm saying that, no, Daniel 2 is about the resurrection kingdom because that's how the book ends, with the hope of the resurrection kingdom. That, okay, that's, so... This is, yeah. we'll, we'll read verse 44. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. Daniel 7, I believe it says, uh, the kingdom will be given to the holy people of the saints of the Most High, etc. Yeah. Kingdom, dominion, and the greatness of the kingdoms under heaven will be given to it. We're talking about a kingdom coming. In the image, the rock is smashing the idol. It's a kingdom coming and smashing the idol. How is that? Jesus resurrecting from the dead. So the Muslims can actually show a physical empire that came and destroyed the Roman Empire. Christians, on the other hand, are saying, or you're saying that Jesus resurrected from the dead. How is that a fulfillment? It doesn't sure. Work. Well, it's because he's the king bringing the resurrection kingdom. And as I pointed out, the Islamic empires are finished. They're like they're not the eternal kingdoms of God. You end up having to spirit- spiritualize it because there is no Islamic empire anymore. No, I, I responded to that, but I mentioned that first of okay. all, it doesn't even need to be forever. So because... we'll table it for now. Just um, we'll, yeah, we'll go on to the next one. Last word on it because it was his question, and then we can uh, see if we can revisit it. But there, there are a couple guests, and there's uh, some some additional questions. So um, the next question is: How can you appeal to the New Testament to prove prophecies? Isn't that circular reasoning? And again, this is for Mr. Green. Yeah, thank you. Well, the reason I'm appealing to the New Testament to prove prophecies is because that's the question we're looking at today. The question is, is Muhammad foretold in the Bible? And so I'm taking the Bible as it stands. Now, if you want to challenge what the Bible says, that's a different thing. But I'm looking at what the Bible says. So when the Bible says that Jesus is the Messiah, when the New Testament says Jesus is the Messiah, I'm, I'm saying he's the Messiah because that's what the Bible says. So that, that's the question we're looking at, and I'm, I'm showing how the Bible answers this question. So that's so I don't see the circular. I'm just looking at what it says. Yeah, so the oh. issue here is thinking that, first of all, that there's a common agreement in the whole Bible throughout uh, and that the new, but we know, like for a fact, that the New Testament uses fake prophecies and tries to apply them to Jesus. So we actually have to look at what prophecy fits what figure and figure it out from there. We can't just say, "Oh, the New Testament claims it's Jesus, so it's Jesus." For example, the Gospel of Matthew claims Hosea 11 is about Jesus. 
This is what Hosea 11 says. It's speaking about the Exodus. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. Talking about the Exodus. And the New Testament says it's Jesus. And this doesn't work anyway, because I brought up like Jeremiah chapter one, literally quotes Deuteronomy 18 and says it's about Jeremiah. But the New Testament says it's about Jesus. In the Gospel of Matthew, it says Jesus is the prophet like Moses. But if you read the book of Acts, it says that the Deuteronomy 18 cannot be is not fulfilled yet. It will be fulfilled in the future. So even if you think Acts is applying it to Jesus, it would be Jesus' second coming. So even the New Testament is disagreeing about how Jesus fulfills Deuteronomy 18. Okay. Well, again, the question today was, what does the Bible say? And that's what I've been showing. To say that Matthew misquotes the prophecies, uh, you, you're wrong. As I showed, Jesus comes as the true Israelite and he has the special birth, like Israel had the special birth. He goes into Egypt as e Israel went into Egypt. The children are killed in both cases. And so when Matthew is quoting Hosea 11, he is saying that Jesus is fulfilling Israel's destiny. Israel was brought out of Egypt and turned to idolatry. Jesus fulfills it by coming out of Egypt and being the faithful servant of the Lord. And that, that's just the big thing. Jesus is the true Israelite. Once you realize that, all the prophecies are, are valid. They're not. Very good. So we'll table it there because it'll, it's a, it was a question for him, so we'll give him the final word on them. Uh, so another one for Samuel. How do you feel about the 8th century Jewish text saying Muslims saved them from Christians and allowed them into Jerusalem? Yeah, I'd, I'd say that there's absolutely truth to that. In the early centuries of Christianity, for the first 300 uh, the Jews would hand the Christians over to the Jew, uh, to, to the Romans. And so, um, well, the, the non-Christian Jews would hand the, the Jews over, sorry, hand the Christians over to the Romans. And so things didn't get off to a good start. The Roman Empire then becomes Christian and then things are turned around for the Jews and then they have, uh, they have a difficult time. Um, and Islam certainly liberates them, but I want to say li liberates them for, for a very short period of time, right? And so the Jews and, and Christians are both vimy, having to pay the terms of surrender in the Islamic empire. And so it's, it, you know, it's it, it, as I said, it's just changing of who your overlords are, who the, the upper class are. All you've done is change them. You're not actually liberated. I mean, if Islam was liberating Jews, why don't you let the Jews rebuild the temple? That's what they want. They want to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. If you're so good for, for, for Judaism, then let them rebuild the temple. Very well. Uh, Rahim, if you want to speak to that, and we'll come back to Samuel. And then I think we do have a question um, in the back for Ibrahim. Yeah, so uh, this is another text that Moshe Gill uh, quotes. This is, a, I believe, a rabbi, and he says, uh, And from our God there befell his mercy upon us before the kingdom of Ishmael at the time when their power expanded and they captured the Holy Land from the hands of Edom and came to Jerusalem. There were people from the children of Israel with them. They showed them the spot of the temple and they settled with them until this very day. And I also mentioned in the beginning that if you look at the lands to which the Israelites were exiled and they assimilated, etc., those are now Muslim lands. So they did become Muslims, even if, by the way, we uh, are for the sake of argument, for the sake of argument, I say that the Jews were only saved for a little bit. It doesn't matter because in second Isaiah, Cyrus saves them from Babylon. And that was not for a long time. The Greeks came, they defiled the temple. The Romans came, they oppressed the, the Israelites, Hitler, etc., so even Cyrus didn't save them for very long. So even if the Muslims only saved the Jews for a short period, hypothetically, that wouldn't contradict the prophecies. Tim, would you like to speak to that? Um, I'm just trying to get something really quick on this. Let me just get this up because I think there's a really important reference. Let me just get this up over here. Where are we? Um, so there's a very famous... Almost got it here, almost got it here. Okay, so uh, Moses Maimonides. Okay, Moses Maimonides in his epistle to the Yemen, and I can put this in the, the chat if you wish. Um, he, he actually speaks of Islam. So initially Islam does help the Jews, 
but Maimonides later on says, never did a nation molest, degrade, and debase and hate us as, as much as they. And so that's what Maimonides said. I'll just put this in the chat so that you've, we've actually got the reference. So th this is what I mean. It's, you know, if we're going to say that, hang on, get rid of that. Yeah, Maimonides is writing a polemic, by the way. Because he's Maimonides is responding to Muslims, and he's because the Muslims were uh, giving like uh, calling Jews to Islam, etc. So like Maimonides uh, engages in dialogue, and he like tries to refute the prophecies of the Prophet Muhammad, etc. So his testimony is not uh, like, for example, does he give us evidence here? And am I saying that there was never anything negative that happened to Jews among the Muslims? No, but the events that I've mentioned about the uh, what the prophecies speak about, about Jerusalem being freed, etc., and that eventually even the majority of Israelites becoming Muslims, they are sufficient. Um, there, there are a couple of questions uh, in the chat. Yeah. I'm happy to move on. Happy to move on. That sounds good. So uh, I'm just going down the order of Super Chats so far. So we've got two more Super Chats, then we've got some guests in the back. So it's not again from uh, Lord Yamcha. If Deuteronomy 17 was written by Moses, why does it contradict latter biblical motifs about marriage and how come it speaks about Solomon? Yes, well, th that's because Solomon doesn't... Uh, Solomon's life starts off well, but ends up bad. And so... He doesn't follow the law of Moses in the end and takes many wives and his wives continue in the worship of the gods from the nations and um, it causes trouble for Solomon. Yeah, so so the point I was making and that scholars are making is that Deuteronomy 17 is actually written after Solomon. Actually, the way it came about is first Samuel gave the law to the of the kings and that was uh, taken and placed in a new context where Moses is giving the law of the kings and then a critique of Solomon is being mentioned. The reason I mentioned the Solomon point is because it proves that it didn't come from Moses. Most didn't say Deuteronomy 17, the law of kings, because the wives thing is, a, is, is an example of this, because in 2 Samuel, God is bragging to David about how he blessed him with many wives. But according to Deuteronomy 17, the king cannot have many wives. So there's a contradiction. What happened is that because the Israelites thought that Solomon took many wives and thus his heart was led astray, they made up this law saying that the king cannot have many wives. Deuteronomy 17.15, where it refers to the nation of Israel's brother is Israel in context, doesn't make any sense. It's sloppy editing uh, and it's grammatically incorrect because these are not the words of Moses. This is a scribe writing this who's taken the law that Samuel gave. And placed it in a new context. Samuel said that the brothers, it just meant like your fellow brothers, etc. But like in Deuteronomy 18.15, it says you, like the, it will come from your brothers, and your is in the singular. It's referring to the nation of Israel. So Israel has been personified as one person, and it's saying the prophet will come from their brothers. And later it says, like Israel said, in verse 16 to 17, I think, Israel said, let me not hear this voice anymore, or I will die. Again, Israel is speaking of itself in the singular, so yes, the brother of Israel is what it's talking about. And those are other, uh, the, the brother wow. nations. And Mr. Okay, Green, well, the final word on that? Yeah, so I think Ibrahim has just given a great example there of how, um, how in order to make his point, he's got to attack the Bible and say it's been changed, it's been written later and updated. Uh, it's a thoroughly anachronistic reading that he's given there to say that because Deuteronomy 8.17 says don't take many wives, and we see that with David, that it must have been rewritten at another time and put back. There's no evidence for that. It's just an anachronistic reading. All of David's wives were Jewish women who worshipped Yahweh. Um, the, the thing with Deuteronomy 17 is that, he takes the, is that they take the women from elsewhere and from the other nations. So it's completely different. And also David doesn't have many wives. He's only got a few. Dave, uh, Solomon has hundreds. So yes, there is polygamy in the Old Testament, but this is a question to do with polygamy. It's not to do with taking huge numbers of wives because he doesn't take huge numbers of wives and they're all uh, Jewish believers, sorry, Israelite believers. Uh, it literally all says right, fantastic. a lot of wives. Well, I got to table it because we've got to move on. Um, so... Uh, we have another one, uh, Matthew 27, 52 to 53, about the dead saints raising from the dead. 
Uh, wouldn't this event be reported by Romans and others if it uh, truly occurred? Um, somewhat not relevant to the subject, but it's up to you if you yeah. wish to answer it. Yeah, well, look, obviously there are things in the Bible which are only reported in the Bible. And this would be one of these occasions. Sometimes in the New Testament, we can go to sources outside of the Bible and actually see where things were recorded. So in the book of Josephus, it records John the Baptist. It records, records Jesus' brother. It says things about Jesus. Um, and, you know, and so sometimes we can go outside and confirm it. Sometimes we can't. This is just one of these occasions where it's unique to the Bible. And, and that's what I've got to work with. Uh, Maurice, uh, there's someone uh, in the chat. He's asking if he can join without a face, but I actually know this person, so I think he'll be fine. Uh, I sure, recognize yeah, no his problem. username. No problem. Um, and then it's, uh, uh, because the subject... Kedushi. No problem. Because the question really wasn't too relevant to the topic, I don't think it's worth expanding yeah. upon. Um, there is another one that popped in as well. So Maimonides was referring to the al Mahads in Al-Andalus, when he spoke negatively about Muslims, but he later became the personal physician of the Sultan in Egypt and lived very gracefully with Muslims. Um, not really so much a question, but uh, you know, at least I don't I, see Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. But just to say that Islam brings liberation for them, I'm saying you know, it's a bit mixed, right? In in the actual events that the prophecies foretell, right, which is what I'm speaking about, about, about the reign of the Umar radiallahu an and uh, the exiles coming back, it doesn't even need to be forever. So even hypothetically, uh, if, I, if we say that it wasn't for a long time, it's irrelevant. And I gave the example of Cyrus. He didn't save them forever. The Greeks defiled the temple. The Romans destroyed the temple, etc. We did also have a, a limitation on questions, but if both panelists are okay, then I'm happy to uh, bring on some additional questions. To make it a little bit fair, I think there are some Christians in the back that are looking to ask Ibrahim some questions. Uh, Rob, I'm going to bring you up here. If you're ready, just give me a thumbs up. All right, great. Hey, guys. Mic check. Hello. Mic works. All right. I have a question in relation to Daniel 2 and um, say Song of Songs. Do you take the view, as Zach was saying, that the image is the same from gold down as in Song of Songs? Do I it's think that Daniel 2 is, yep. uh, do I think that Daniel, that Song of Solomon 10 to 16 is parodying Daniel's statue? Is yep. that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. It's been mentioned by some scholars. Okay, but which book came first? Uh, what do I believe? Yeah. I believe the Song of Solomon comes second. But even if you think Song of Solomon comes first, so what? We believe the Bible has prophecies. We're not uh, atheists. Okay, so critical scholars take Daniel as a popular Yeah, but critical scholars are uh, coming with a naturalistic the assumption. Context, and song so of songs just remember, using... limit it to just one question, okay. make it concise, straight okay. to the point, relevant to the so, topic. So my, okay, my next question is, with respect to that, why do critical scholars hold to the Maccabean view of Daniel? They see Alexander the Epiphanes in regards to the kingdoms. And in Song of Songs 5, they're using Ugaritic Baal imagery, the idol imagery, uh, as a play of words because it's Ugaritic terms in Chapter 5 of Song of Songs. I don't... So how could you say Muhammad is mentioned in Song of Songs when it's Ugaritic? terminology how does that how does ugaritic terminology refute it being about about the prophet muhammad i don't understand Be, because mamtakim and muhammadim are ugaritic words not hebrew yeah so what so it can't be an no Ugarit like what's your premise premise muhammad. conclusion so because a, a, a baal statue also starts with a golden head down okay as you see in song of songs so that that imagery is applied to solomon daniel is totally is after song of songs it's regards to the Maccabean context. It's so how can about, okay. Daniel two and Song of Songs be applied to Islam and Muhammad, who comes well like, over? I don't. I, so you're saying because there's a head of gold, and there's Ugaritic terms, it can be a reference to Solomon, but it can't be a reference to Muhammad. I don't, you like your. It's not a valid argument, Rob. Like well, you know I'm, what, what a I'm valid argument is. The original is? context. The original context of Song of Songs in, is in regards to the imagery of the ancient Ares, idol yeah, so, uh, development. 
and how that imagery is applied to so to Solomon, who is a living idol, like like he's more beautiful than the Baal idols that are that is known in that culture. That has well, no relation to Daniel two, though. Like Daniel two and Song of Songs five are not speaking about each other. Do you think? All right, Daniel... so just out of respect for the panelists, right? So I'm going to give Ibrahim the last word right now on how he wants to address your question and the manner right. that he wants to address it. I'm going to I'm going to bring you down. I'm going to bring the next guest up. So Ibrahim, go ahead and uh, yeah, take the. Yeah, uh, just an invalid argument. Like uh, it's premise, premise, conclusion doesn't follow. Uh, it can be a reference to Solomon, but it can't be a reference to the prophet Muhammad. Do you see what I'm? Solomon's a, a a prophet as well, so I don't. It, it's a par. Yeah, it is a parody of the uh, statue uh, of Daniel two, because in Daniel two you have a statue where the metals are degrading in quality, but in Song of Solomon's you uh, you have like this image, right? But it's perfect throughout. But anyway, that's not like a even a very important point in uh, Song of Solomon. It's like not even, a, it's like a tertiary port point. I don't know. Anyway. Okay, great. So uh, it's going to bounce back over to Samuel. So uh, Marwa, I'm going to go ahead and add you to the stream. And uh, please just uh, feel free to ask your question when you're ready. And uh, make sure to unmute yourself. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Hello. Um, uh, I would like to ask um, uh, Mr. Green regarding uh, the book. You cut out briefly. We can't hear you right now. It's in regards to the book. That's all that we heard. Chapter three. Sorry, can you, I can you hear me? Hear you would like to repeat yourself. Uh, can you hear me better now? I can hear you now. Yes. Okay. So um, I'm talking about the book of Zephaniah, chapter 3. Um, yes. This, um, this book, uh, this chapter is very messianic. And uh, from the prophecies that has been given, and I can see also from, I don't like to dwell much about it, but I, I can go through the whole chapter. But just to be specific to uh, verse um, 9 and 10. Uh, first, it speaks about uh, bringing a pure language. And this is something that I don't see that actually happened in any other religion. I mean, I wouldn't see Christianity coming with a pure language. And also Torah, I mean, also is already in chapter, I mean, chapter three, number five, it's already said that it is not already followed. So we can see that the situation and the remnant already is not already having something. And then something is introduced with a pure language. And above that, we see also where it is introduced and what is being introduced leads to. Whereas people, the humble people, are gathered side by side by the river of Kush, which is in Sudan, which is basically Saudi Arabia, and they're giving their offering, which is exactly what happens every year. I mean, I would see it as something that is quite astounding, honestly, when I see the Triton and seeing it happening. Honestly, I find it, um, I mean, um, what does your say about that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I'm not able to go through all of Zephaniah now, but when you read Zephaniah, it talks about the Israelites speaking the names of other gods. It speaks about the Israelites with unfaithfulness on their lips. And so chapter 3 of Zephaniah is about the restoration that God is going to bring. And so it's talking about the Israelites no longer using their lips to say Baal and Molech and the names of other gods, but now they will call on the name of the Lord. And again, it's it's the name of Yahweh. It's not the name of Allah. It's the name of Yahweh. Um, and so it says from beyond the, the rivers of Cush, well, that's, that's the Nile River. That's the, the Cush is the upper reaches of the Nile. So I just see it as the Israelites no longer calling on foreign gods, uh, and so their lips are purified by what they say and, and that it, it's actually referring to um, the, the Kush River, the, uh, you know, the upper regions of the Nile. Yeah, uh, Zephaniah chapter 3 works as a prophecy. Uh, in terms of the language part, there are translations that translate it as language, like the American Standard Version, for then I will turn to the peoples of a pure language, 
or I shall return upon the people, the chosen language, etc. So it can be understood as about a plain language. But even if you want to take it as about like uh, they won't speak idolatry, that works for Islam as well. Also, uh, it can be taken as uh, they will call upon the Lord shoulder to shoulder with the Muslims do when we pray. But you can even, however you take Zephania 3, it works. And I believe Zephania 3 talks about exiles coming back as well, which again, Jesus didn't do. Um, Jesus the opposite of exiles coming back. Um, so, yeah, Mr. Green, if you want to have a final word on that, and tomorrow we're going to jump over to the next question, but I'm happy to okay. put you back in the queue. Thank you. All right. Thank you. To, thank you very much for your question. And my final comment would be j just go and read the book of Zephaniah. It's only three short chapters and just read it and y you can work it out. Sure. Uh, I have a, I have a rebuttal to the, to what has been said, but I just don't want to go on far further on it. But I, I would refer to the commentary and uh, the commentary already brings something, an idea that already is different. But anyways, thank you so much. Thank you. You're most welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalamu alaikum. Alaikum alaikum all right, so uh, there was a question in the back chat, just so I can be fair and throw it back over to Ibrahim. And then um, we'll conclude with just these final couple questions. So uh, the question is, uh, if Jesus is the paraclete, doesn't it mean that Jesus will send him in John 15 through 16? Doesn't that create a problem as Allah had sent Muhammad, not Jesus? Yeah, so the first thing is, if you read John 14, if you, if you use John 14 to exegete John 15 to 16, uh, Jesus says that I will pray to the Father and he will send you another uh, paraclete. So how is Jesus going to send him? By praying to the Father and then the Father is the one who sends him. Uh, secondly, even if you just want to look at 15 to 16, Raymond Brown, uh, I believe, un interpreted the verse about uh, I will send him as the sending is by him leaving. So it's talking about how he will take what is mine and give it to you, meaning revelation. That's how Raymond Brown takes it that I deliver you revelation, he's going to deliver revelation as well. And uh, because he says, I have to go for the paraclete to come, so that's the context. So the way Raymond Brown interprets it because of that context is that his sending is by him uh, going up and then the paraclete can come. And Raymond Brown is like known as the greatest uh, Western New Testament scholar. So yeah, that's how I think it. Samuel, do you have a comment that you'd like to make? Um, well, I'm not sure Raymond Brown's the greatest scholar. Um, well, Western all, scholar. All, all I would simply say is um, go, go to a Bible search program and look up spirit throughout the Gospel of John, and you can see that John the Baptist said Jesus was going to baptize with the spirit. Jesus said he was going to send the spirit, and then he ascends to the Father, comes back, and gives the spirit. So, I mean, there's got to be a place for reading in context. Lovely, thank you, uh, Ibrahim. Final words on that? On that, uh, I, I'll just say, like, I made an argument that uh, Jesus says he has to ascend for the Paraclete to come, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, Samuel said that, oh uh, well, Jesus uh, ascended because he was raised and then he ascended. But if you read John, uh, I believe it's twenty, when he comes to Mary Magdalene, he says, "I have not yet ascended to the to the mm -hmm. Father." And then it says that he came to the disciples on the same day, so Jesus hadn't ascended then. When he, when he gives them the Spirit, it's the same day when he told Mary Magdalene that he hadn't awesome. ascended yet. Awesome. Okay, we can table it for the conclusion. That's not uh, true. Thank uh, you for the question. Uh, if I'm wrong, yeah. you can correct me. But uh, I have the text here. Let me John just bring 20, the next. Uh, uh, let me just bring well, the next. Because well, it, it went him, you, him uh, for the final say. So. Uh, yeah, I'm happy uh, to uh, Donar, you're you're up. Uh, if you can ask your question, please. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. I have a question for uh, Samuel Green um, regarding uh, uh, Isaiah 40 to 42 and uh, Malachi 3. You said that Malachi 3 is about John the Baptist and Jesus, peace be upon them both. But my question is, how can this be the case if we know that Malachi is referring to Isaiah 42, 42 because of the messenger of a covenant and uh, the Lord coming from the desert, etc. But how can this be the case when in Isaiah 40, it talks about the children of Israel coming back into the land and that the, the exile is about to end when we know from history and everything that both Jesus peace be upon him, and uh, John the Baptist, peace be upon him, both of them were in the land, 
and uh, they didn't come during the exile and also that Jesus himself t uh, t told everyone that uh, the punishment is about to start again and that the exile is about to start again. So how can this be Jesus when it's the opposite of uh, Isaiah 42, 42? And if, if it's not during, uh, as we know, it can't be the Babylonian exile, so which exile did someone who made the people of Qaidar, came with a new law, fought idolatry, come uh, after the Babylonian exile. Answer that, please. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Donat. Um, first of all, Malachi is definitely about two individuals. So Malachi 3 verse 1, See, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. Um, the messenger of the covenant whom you desire, uh, says the Lord Almighty. So th there's definitely two, and it, it goes on to specify that it will be Isaiah will, sorry, as Elijah will be one of those, uh, will be the one who prepares the way. The New Testament says it, it's John the Baptist. Um, that, that's how it identifies him. So I see Malachi standing on its own with what it says there. Now, regarding um, Isaiah 42, I'm just trying to put together what you're saying there. You're saying about the, the messenger of the covenant. Um, I'm not 100% sure what point you're uh, making on well, that now. What he's saying is that... Um, it, Can I say again? I, or... Yeah, okay, go ahead. No, okay, it's not for me. Go. Oh, well, basically what he was saying that is that he's connecting Isaiah 40 and 42 to Malachi 3. Uh, so, you know, because, Thanks. yeah, so uh, the reason he's connecting 40 to Malachi 3 is because of prepare the way. And the reason he's connecting 42 to Malachi 3 is because uh, Malachi 3 says messenger of the covenant and Isaiah 42 says I've given you as a covenant. Yeah. And then what he's saying is that in Isaiah 40 to 42, an exile is ending. Yeah. But uh, um, Jesus was in the land, meaning uh, there was no exile and uh, the exile actually started when Jesus came and stuff. So he's asking. Yeah, thank you. Good. Sorry, there was just a few things there. Um, yeah, yeah, so what, as I said, Malachi 3, 1 and Malachi 4, uh, Malachi 4, 5, make it clear that there's two people and that one of them's preparing for the other one to come to the temple. And really, there's only ever been two people who have done that. That's John the Baptist and Jesus. Jesus came to the temple. Regarding the exile, the Jews, uh, the the scriptures talk about how the exile has come to an end, but yet they're still in exile. And so the Jews return from the Babylonian exile, but the theological issue is but it, the, the promise of the kingdom of God hasn't come yet. And you know, we didn't do this, but in Isaiah 40, it talks about a new exodus, a new return, a new return from exile. But this time it's, a, a re, it's an exodus from sin. Now, this raises a whole new other, other issue, but it, it uses the Exodus language to describe the new exile that's coming, but it's, an, it's a return and leaving sin, not just coming back. That becomes, this is a, a big debate on its own. Um, but in regards to the um, Isaiah 66, 19, talks about how, Right at the very end, when, when this return happens, there's still going to be judgment on Israel. So even though we're talking about the, the, the return of the exiles and various things, we've got to look at what is going to be this new return. And, and there's still judgment involved. And again, I'd point you to Isaiah 66, verse 19. Right. Um, yeah, but the judgment, can't it be about the Roman judgment? It can't be about the Roman judgment. Why not? Sorry, I'll, can you give me a bit more explanation there? Because sure the, the point mean. is, if we know historically, it's talk about the children of Israel. They are in the in the uh, exile period. Do you really think that when God tells them that they will enter the land again and everything will be good, etc., how do you really think that those who were in exile were thinking, oh, it's just a spiritual exile and we will not come? Yeah, well, certainly that's that's something the Jews wrestle with. So they they feel that they're back in the land. So even after the Babylonian return, because remember, they come back after Babylon 
but the blessings that they were promised through the prophets hadn't come. And so you see this in Daniel chapter 9 uh, and where they're back in the land, but the blessings of the prophets haven't come. So under Ezra, they build the temple, but there's still problems around them. Under Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah, so this whole book's on this, they build the wall, but the exile still hasn't come to an end. And so they've come back out of exile. They're back in the land, but the prophetic books are still saying that in terms of our relationship with God, we're still in exile. Yeah, I mean, this becomes a big discussion on its own. Yeah, no problem. We can, uh, we can my, table it. Just um, my thoughts, because uh, I yeah. didn't speak yet. But uh, what I'd say is well, there are two exiles that are spoken of, actually three if you count the Assyrian exile in the Bible. So we have the Babylonian exile, and then the texts I brought are about the Roman exile. It's not a spiritual exile. It's about talking about the actual Roman exile. Like Isaiah 49 says, I will uh, keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people to restore the land and to reassign its desolate inheritances. And then it talks about how they're coming back. Uh, and like, uh, yeah, like just read 49, like they're all coming back to, to the land, et cetera. It's very explicit. It's not spiritual. This is what just another example of when Christians have to metaphorize the Bible, they have to turn it into spiritual. So Jesus didn't save them from an actual exile. So it's actually a spiritual exile, etc. No, it's quite explicit. Yeah, I wanted talking to about ask, a literal exile. Exactly. I wanted oh, to I mention to about uh, because there's a lot of back and forth going on. Uh, Maurice, uh, Maurice, just let's just have like one more question. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's I, actually that that it that was it because uh, we it. spent quite a bit of time on this question. Yep. So um, thank you to all the folks that have submitted the questions. What we're going to do right now is move over to the final segment, which is the concluding remarks. Uh, we did have a soft limit of five minutes on this, um, but because there was a lot of back and forth on the questions, I'm going to leave it up to the speakers to go as short as they wish. So uh, maximum of five minutes, but feel free to go as short as you wish. And uh, Mr. Green, I believe uh, the floor is yours. All right. Well, uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you today. I really appreciate I've appreciated you, Maurice, in terms of your moderating and Ibrahim in terms of uh, the, the arguments you put forward and the manner in which we've been able to speak. And I think it's important for us to be able to do this. And I want to thank everyone who's uh, watched today and participated for the questions because the, the things of God are important to us. And so we need to, uh, to be able to discuss these things and, and work out uh, our issues. To summarise what I said in my talk, I said that the, the, the Quran in Surah 7, 157 refers to the Bible as an authority. It says that Christians and Jews can know that Muhammad is a true prophet and the Quran is real because he's found um, in the Torah and in, in the gospel that is with them, that's with them. Uh, I've shown that this is not the case, and so this is why Christians don't accept Muhammad, uh, and I gave three reasons. The first was that, the, uh, was that Muhammad doesn't just fit into the story of the Bible. The story of the Bible is of God creating us, of us being corrupted by sin and needing the resurrection, life, and forgiveness of God, and that Jesus brings this, and that with Jesus all of God's promises come to their fulfillment and we wait for him and it, it's all about Jesus. And so to say that there's an, another, you know, a prophet who, who, who just comes in after this, it just doesn't fit with the story. And the example I gave was it's like saying uh, that the Baha'i say that Baha'i Allah is foretold in the Quran. It, it just doesn't fit in that story. Next, we went through a whole series of verses and, I'm not going to try to go through those again, but uh, th there are no verses which say that there's a prophet from amongst the Arabs who's going to come, and th there's just not. When we look at each of those, they're referring to other things. And then my final point was that the Bible warns us uh, about prophets and that we need to be careful. And if you're a Muslim, you, you need to, to, to not just automatically accept Muhammad, you need to, to check him honestly yourself because there are false prophets, and that's something that you need to honestly ask yourself. Um, <clears throat> I, I gave the example of 
Muhammad from the book of, uh, from the Hadith saying when the hour would come and that that obviously didn't happen at that time, whether or not that Hadith in Sahih Muslim is reliable, I don't know. Um, Muslims would see it as reliable, but there's that. And then, of course, he teach, Muhammad teaches a different gospel. And so for these reasons, we see that his teaching doesn't match up with the prophets. His teaching doesn't match up with the gospel. Um, the things he predicted didn't happen. And so, so we don't accept him. And so uh, basically, I'd just like to finish by saying I'd just like to encourage everyone to read all of the prophets. That's what the Bible is. It's not one book. It's a collection of many books from many prophets. And um, I'd encourage Muslims not to be turning people away from reading the prophets, but to actually just read them on their own terms and to come to your own conclusion as to whether or not uh, Muhammad is foretold in the Bible. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Green. Uh, Rahim, the floor is yours. Your timer will start uh, once you begin speaking. Remember, maximum five minutes, but up to you how long you want to go. At the end, I just want to sort of connect the texts I've mentioned and show how they like string together, make a nice story. So Daniel 2 talks about a kingdom of God coming after the Roman Empire and punishing it. Isaiah 9 also speaks about a child coming will have a symbol of authority upon his shoulder. By the way, the symbol of authority on the prophet's shoulder wasn't just a mole. It was uh, different. It was more miraculous than that. If you look at how it's described in Hadith, etc., it's not just a mole. Uh, and anyway, it, it can be the symbol of authority, can be a key, a scepter, a sword, etc. So for the Prophet Muhammad, he had a natural one. So anyway, Isaiah 9 talks about this child's coming, and his coming leads to the defeat of Rome and Palestine. So notice the theme of Rome. Daniel 2 coming after the Roman Empire, Isaiah 9, the defeat of Rome. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had a seal of prophethood on his shoulder, and he set up the kingdom which punished Rome. Isaiah 35 also talks about the Roman exile ending and the Israelites being allowed to return to the land, which again the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did. Notice the theme of Rome again. Isaiah 42 makes clear that a servant will convert the Gentiles, such as the Ishmaelites, and this links up, this links up to Isaiah 19, which speaks about the Egyptians and Assyrian Gentiles coming into the knowledge of God. So you see the Gentiles are coming into the knowledge of God. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, converted them. Isaiah 42 talks about him opening the blind eyes of the Gentiles, and this also matches Isaiah 29, 32, and 35, where we had like the spiritually blind will see, etc. These texts also mention how the desert will rejoice, a book from God will be heard, and a righteous king will rule, as well as an exile will end, all of which the Muslims did. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, opened the eyes of the nations, brought the Quran, a book from God, set up a kingdom with kings following him, made the desert rejoice, and ended in exile. Isaiah 29 also, by the way, speaks about the tyrant being defeated, again bringing up the theme of the Romans being defeated in the land. Finally, Isaiah 42, which speaks about alike the Gentiles converting them into monotheism, links up to Genesis 12, where it's Abraham's descendants who will bless the nations. And it was the Ishmaelite prophet who fulfilled the scripture, as well as his companions, all of whom are descendants of Abraham, who also fulfilled Isaiah 42. And I also mentioned that the righteous seed of Isaac, such as Gab al ahbar and Abdullah bin Salam, are how the prophecy was fulfilled for uh, Isaac's uh, children blessing the nations. Malachi 3 links up with Isaiah 42 because they both speak about the messenger of the covenant and the prophet Muhammad peace be upon him fulfilled Malachi 3 by being taken to the temple suddenly. And Matthew 21 43 was also fulfilled by the Ishmaelites when they replaced the Jews. So again, which figure to appear, appeared having a symbol of authority upon his shoulder, bringing the kingdom after Rome, punishing Rome, ending the Roman exile, he would open blind eyes through a book. He would make the desert rejoice. He would convert the Gentiles, including the Ishmaelites, Egyptians, and Assyrians. And which children of Abraham are the ones who bless the nations? And which nation replaced the Jews? And which messenger of the covenant suddenly came to the temple? These are very specific, very difficult to fulfill criteria. Christians, on the other hand, have to spiritualize these prophecies. And we, see we saw that today as well. And I'll leave it there. All right, fantastic. Thank you very much to both of you guys. Uh, on behalf of everyone at Dowwise and myself, thank you both for taking the time to discuss the topic, Is Muhammad Foretold in the Bible? The session indeed was informative. And with this information, we encourage the audience to reflect on the topic along with the points presented. Uh, thank you both, Ibrahim and Samuel. We truly hope that uh, to have you back on uh, this mm -hmm. platform to either expand upon this topic or to discuss others. Uh, we're going to conclude the session now, and in the same manner that we greeted you with peace, 
Uh, may peace be upon all of you that tuned in and please be sure to share the contents. And if you have uh, not done so already, please consider subscribing and uh, in, in turn also becoming a member as well. So, uh, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And uh, thank you once again for joining and uh, may peace be upon all of you guys that are watching. Mm.